Good morning. We are live. Another Friday edition of Coffee with Rich. Of course, Coffee with Rich is brought to you by the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, which is America's number one self-defense podcast. And this morning I'm joined by Chris Palmer. And Chris is uh, a member of a large metropolitan uh, police agency out in the Southwest. We'll get to his bio in just a minute. But this is actually Chris's second appearance on the American Warrior Show. You can find Chris's first appearance, show number 214. Um, my dear friend and business partner, Mike Seeklander, interviewed Chris, and it was an amazing show. I highly encourage you to go back and listen to show 214. I think it came out the first of last year, because what we're going to do is I'm not going to mulch over the same territory that, that Mike and Chris have already covered today. We're just going to kind of pick up where they left off and cover some things that I, I really wanted to talk to Chris about. Um, here in just a moment, I'm going to read his bio, but before I do, like I already said, welcome to Coffee with Rich, but let me, let me tell you who I am. My name is Rich Brown. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to read my bio, check out AmericanWarriorSociety.com. Let's see who's already joining us this Friday morning. Dan is on from Flowery Branch, Georgia, coin number 1968. If you want to know what a coin number is, please check out American Warrior Society. Alan Kelly, retired Virginia State Trooper. Good morning, my dear dear friend. Coin number 1571. Johnny is on from Kentucky. Good morning, Johnny. Please like and hit that share button before we get going. I'm going to give you a quick moment to take a share break before we get going with Chris. You're going to want to share this content with someone you care about because I think Chris is going to help make us all a little bit safer today with the information he's going to give us. So take a quick second and hit the share button. Hit that like button. Tony is on, another brother Marine down there in Brunswick, Georgia. Georgia. Good morning, Tony. Linda is on from Fort Worth, Texas. Good morning, Linda. Guys, please hit that share button. We're going to get started. Let me introduce Chris Palmer, who should need no introduction. But uh, Chris is a former Marine and veteran police officer with 13 years of his career assigned to a full-time SWAT, uh, uh, as a full-time SWAT officer. Chris served as a patrol officer from 1999 to 2001. From 2001 to 2006, Chris was assigned to a NET which is the neighborhood enforcement team. This is where he operated in plain clothes and gained undercover experience. From 2006 to 2019, Chris was a full-time SWAT operator. In this capacity, has been involved in roughly 20 officer-involved shootings. That's right, I said 20 officer-involved shootings and fired his weapon in four of them. At last count, Chris has had 56 rounds fired at him and has been hit once. Chris is currently a full-time firearms instructor for his department breaching instructor for force entry tactical training and the owner of 532 Insight LLC. Good morning, Chris, and welcome to the show, brother. Morning. Hey, man, um, you know, on on uh, the show you did with Mike, show 214, you said you were a low-reg Marine, and so was I, Chris, but what is a low-reg Marine? I didn't have a, one of them uh, horseshoe flat tops. I like to kind of swing it Corman style and keep the hair a little going, but always within regulations. If you want it sharper, define it higher. Yeah. That's all so I know. are you former Marines that are watching this morning? We've got 15 folks joining us live. Thank you to the 15 folks that are on so far. Please like and hit that share button. You former Marines that are on this morning, let me know if you were a high rig, low rig kind of guy. I was always pushing the bounds of that myself. And I don't... <laughs> For those who don't know, there's a regulation style haircut. You're allowed three inches on top and zero around the bottom. And the lower you go is an indicator of something. We won't talk about that. But So, Chris, man, welcome to the show, brother. What did that bio overlook? Pretty impressive bio, but what did we miss there? I think the most important part is the family. Um, got two little girls, got a wife. They're pretty cool. I like them. Um, and I'm finally getting to spend more time with them. And I think I like them even more. Now that I'm not completely engrossed in work and tied to a phone and concentrating on what I'm going to be doing the next day at work, it's it's been very freeing and enjoyable. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Conrad is on. Ruben is on. He said, uh, here's a man who needs no introduction. So here he is. Uh, Ruben is on his way to Montana, where Mike and I will be teaching all week next week. Ruben, I look forward to seeing you in class once again, my friend. Gerald is on. John is on. Terry, Mark, my brother, Jeff Brown. Uh, will Parker. Good morning, Will. I'll see you out there in Montana as well next week. Thank you to the 20 folks that are joining us. So, uh, Chris, one of the things that 
I want to get to your some of your uh, training and experience as far as a SWAT guy, but your current bill is as, 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 as the department or one of the department firearms instructors, man. What makes a great instructor in your opinion? That's a good question. Um, I've actually learned a lot from guys like you and Mike. Um, you're putting on, you're an entertainer. Your, your job, and I don't even know if the students understand it or not, but your job is to be fun, um, but make sure that you're passing on information so that you cannot be misunderstood. Not, not that you say it and, oh, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're saying. It's like you need to clarify it four or five times, and it's not a knock on any of you guys who are students. But what we actually mean and what we're trying to pull out of you for an answer is very important. Um, I prefer to learn from instructors who are engaging, um, constantly moving around and trying to fix each person. They're not just standing in the back, you know, up oh, drill. I, I don't enjoy that at all. Um, that method, I think, kind of lacks intention. I mean, it's almost like they're bored with you. Like you're just, they're just there to get you through whatever it is they're trying to get you done. And that's not how I, how I want to learn. And I think everyone that I've taught seems to enjoy that style of here's what I want you to do. Like the, the edit method, like you said, that's my preferred thing. Um, I explain here's what we're doing and why, because it's important. What we're doing right now, like this drill we're doing right now, isn't has no purpose in tactics. It has no purpose in life other than to find out if your grip works. So people focus too much on the drill thinking it means something like a build drill. Uh, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's just draw and fire six rounds, and can you hang on to the gun good enough to accomplish that task? It is not a tactic. Um, and then I'll demonstrate it, and this is what I want you to do. And then let them practice, and then eventually come together and go, who's the best? And we'll time everybody and put a little competition in it. And people who are afraid of competition um, have other issues in life. They're afraid of themselves a little bit. But the people who enjoy that and don't really care if they lose, that they're going to be have fun. They're, they'll win. I, t I totally agree with you, man. Completely agree with you. And I think that, um, you know, the idea that, you know, you're an entertainer. Um, I was telling, we've got an AI that's coming up to help us next week and Monday. It's what's actually Will. Will's on. He and I were talking yesterday. I said, hey, Will, I want you to get up there and I want you to give your presentation, the two to three minute talk. Remember, I don't know if you remember, Chris, where I went to the back of the room and I did the uh, light switch thing. Yep. Okay. Okay. So. I said, it needs to look impromptu, but I rehearsed that little speech, that little two to three minute class in the hotel that morning before multiple times, but I had to act as if it was an impromptu thing. You know what I'm saying? So I think that uh, the ability to know what you're going to convey and have a depth of that knowledge, but then be able to impart it in a way that they, that every student gets something out of it. Right. I mean, cause I, I could easily just like, speak to the knuckle draggers in the room, but, but I might have a grandmother in there as well. Right. I need to, how do I get that whole audience to, to be on the same page with me? You know? Yeah, I don't think, and I, I've learned, I've learned a ton since I actually left SWAT and I went to firearms about instructing because instructing within the unit is simple. You can like, you can smack someone upside the head. Like, come on, like everybody knows what they're doing. They're all of almost like mind. Um, and they're all on the same team and have known each other forever. But then you go to the, an open, like an, it'd be, I guess, a version of an open enrollment class which would be in service and who have to be there and don't want to be there. You have like, you always have three or four of those guys who are, I'm here because I gotta be here. They have no desire to learn, um, but they still will. If you're, if you're doing a good job of there, they will get engaged and they will actually participate and you can't just abandon all hope on them because the vast majority are too quiet to say anything. And then you'll have the six or seven who are super excited to be there and actually want to learn. But I think that actually covers about 90%. But 90% of them want to learn because they know they don't know enough. Um, and the guys who think they know everything are the simplest to show why they don't. You just demonstrate something real quick and they go, well, crap, I don't know how to do that. And then you kind of get their interest like, shit, I want to be able to do what that guy does. Yeah. To to yeah, thanks, man. Tony just said high and tight, flat top. In the beginning, really, really low rig by the end. Dr. T.C. Fuller is on, retired FBI agent. Good morning. Uh, Manher from South Africa. Good morning, sir. Looking forward to having you on the show. Uh, Stephen Washington out there in Rockford. I'll see you, Stephen, in Michigan in a, in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to teaching that class with you, brother. Kathleen is on. Guile is on from the Philippines. Jay is on from Hawaii. Good morning, Jay. 
Thank you to the 20 folks joining us live. Please like and hit that share button. We are just getting going. You know, Chris, I, um, one of the things you mentioned was you don't like an instructor that kind of just kind of stands in the back and he's he's just yelling out commands. And if you remember, that was one of the things that everybody kept asking me and Mike, do you guys want the the sound sheen and all this stuff? And we kept like, no, no, no. You know, I don't want to be rude, but I feel like get that crap away from me, man. If I'm if I'm a hundred yards behind the line yelling into a microphone, I'm not doing my job. And I was before we did this, I was looking back at some of the notes I kept when you and I, you and your partner did your team teach back. And I was looking at the remarks uh, that Mike and I wrote because I keep all those. And I was looking at it like, you know, and, and I wrote down notes like, Chris, you know, you were totally always moving up and down the line. I would tell students to kind of do something stupid and see if you would catch it. And you and your partner caught all of those, man. So kudos to you uh, on that. Thank you. The, yeah, the sound system thing, I think, you know, it was a pet peeve of mine. I hate it. The yeah. PA. I thought you're, you're, and there's, there's a lot in my life that makes me, I have pet peeves. One of them is when people say, what you don't understand is, when I clearly understand what I'm capable of. I hate it when people tell me, what you don't understand. No, I understand perfectly well what I'm capable of. I'm speaking for three hours is one of them. Um, but that thing, when people teach from it, I don't mind it when it's required. Like a large right. group, big drills. All right, now this is the next drill. Explain what we're gonna do there, but any correctional instruction, anything that goes like that has to occur at the line. So your AIs, your other, all the other men and women working the line, that's where all the correction should be with grips and doing all that stuff. You don't correct one guy's grip for everybody on the PA for uh, three minutes. It's a dollar waiting on a dime. Now everybody's waiting. And they're like, is he talking to me? Like, what am, do I, you know, it's, I just think it's a poor way to instruct. It's a great way to run a line, poor way to instruct. Well, yeah. And I want to, I want to back up to something else you said. Thank you to the 24 folks that are joining us. Please hit that share button. We got uh, Chris Palmer, SWAT op, former SWAT operator and current firearms instructor for a large metropolitan police agency in the Southwest. Chris, um, one of the things you said, like this, this idea of a bill drill and, and Mike and I see this all the time and I, you probably do too, this idea that the training is the drill. It's like, what skill are we trying to teach? You know, why are you, but the, the, I think a lot of people are just enamored with, Hey, we're going to get out here and run these drills. It's so freaking what, man. <clears throat> what are you trying to teach? Could yeah. you talk about that, brother? Yeah, that goes to almost every single thing we do. So I don't have a, a coin or a patch. Um, I think it's kind of fun to have for people, but like using the build drill is the simplest example. Um, or even a transition of like two, two, head, head. Like people go, okay, that, that's multiple attackers. No, that could be one attacker. Now he's here. Now he's here. Like you're just moving the gun as he runs to his new position. It is a diagnostic, like the build drill. Can this person draw their gun effectively, get on target, and hang on to the gun enough to press very accurate shots quickly, six of them in a row specifically? And then what does the target look like? Well, this is what I do when a guy mugs me or if I come around the corner and clear a building and the guy's like, no, because it's just not how it is. Like, it has nothing to do with anything. It's a it's a gun handling drill. And I think if people understand that more, like you said, it's not the tactic. It's This is a drill specific to that. And if we comboed it up with something else, it would only be really doing this one thing. And by learning those skill sets and trying to figure out how well you do all of them, you're just going to apply them when the time comes to a lethal force encounter. And it isn't one of those... We have to train specifically for this because when the guy comes around the corner at the ATM, no, there's, there's never going to be a guy at the ATM. Yours is going to be at the McDonald's drive through or walking out of the Circle K, like the convenience store. It, I hate it when people specify, a, especially a scenario, to a drill. Well, what's the scenario? There isn't one. I'm just telling you to go do this. Well, why would I do it? I don't know. What, what would make you do it? Well, if zombies about, cool, they're here. Go do the drill. It's To me, it's that simple. Like, I keep, I'm just kind of rambling on about it because I think it's been overdone. Everybody has to have something special. But if it's a specific drill and you train to just do that drill, you lack skill in everything else. You have to constantly be changing up the methods at which you're training. Like draw and fire one and draw and fire 12. Like change it up. It doesn't have to be six. But is the seventh where your grip falls apart? Is the eighth? Is it the third? Um, and really break down the minutia of what you're actually trying to train on. And I think you're going to get more out of it. Some people cannot draw and fire six rounds in an A zone at seven yards or 10 yards and get all hits. 
slow fire. They just can't. So let's figure that out first. Yeah, I, I love it. And if you're watching this morning, thank you to the 24 folks that are on. What you're going to get from Chris is tacit knowledge, and that is contextualized knowledge. And I think that is the crux of what he's talking about here. It's there's nothing wrong with a build drill. I'm not poo-pooing on the build drill. It's great if we place it in context. And I get it. You know, you want to say, well, I did the build drill today. I got all A zone hits and I did it in 2.24. And maybe tomorrow I can get it at 2.01 or something like that. And I'm, I'm continually working and developing my skills and I'm tracking it over time, et cetera. But to over rely on the drill or to not place it in the appropriate context is where a lot of well-intentioned instructors really miss the mark, man. I think, Chris, what do you think? Absolutely. Um, and that just kind of popped one of the things in my head. So like we started asking and I got, I think we got it from John Korea. If you remember him, he does, he has that YouTube channel. They review the videos. We had him come out and that's another thing for instructors, everybody. If you only learn from one person, you know, nothing, you know, a little bit of what they know and you might not even know the context. So get as like learn from as many people as possible. But um, John came out and I think he was the one that asked the question. So I've changed it up and we ask all our recruits and in service. Um, we'll give, we'll go, Hey, in the last 20 years, how many law enforcement officers have been involved in a shooting that started at hands or lax size? And they kind of they go, how about the last 40 years? All right. Last 40 years, how many officers have been standing there in the, you know, okay, I'm ready. Hands relax at sides and the bag that pulls a gun and they drew and they did whatever drill you want to shoot. And it's nothing ever, not, no police officers ever been involved in a shooting that way because that's just not how we move around the world. Um, so I asked him, like, what's the number one thing that's been in your hand or officer's hands when they've been in a shooting? Uh, a gun. So why don't we try with the gun out? Or why don't we try with our hand on the gun, like an alert position that makes more sense? Like, and then we'll get into this more about mindset later. Like, you're going to get into one of those positions or else you're just walking around in code white. If you're walking around and you're just unaware, you're going to have to deal with it. But I find it highly unlikely that when the scenario, the bad guy comes out by the ATM and he has a gun in his hand that you're going to turn and go, hold on. And you're going to set yourself in your your get ready position, hands relaxed at sides, and then you're going to have a beep go off in your head, and you're going to deal with him, and he's going to be surprised, and you're going to kill him. Um, that's all BS. I kind of yeah. lost her. There's no, no, I, I love it, man. But I was just thinking, Chris. I don't know if you've seen it. There was a, a shooting that came out. I think they released the video footage yesterday. Uh, there's like four officers. It's it's really bad. It's in an alleyway. I'll have to send it to you if you haven't seen it already, but they're in an alleyway. So you have the potential for blue on blue because the bad guy's in the center and they're, they have terrible backstop. It's just a nightmare. The guy's got a hoodie on. He pulls the gun in the last second. He's like maybe two yards from the cop. The first cop has radio in the left hand, gun in the right hand. He gets shot in the hand and he has to switch hands as he's trying to shoot. It's just a nightmare scenario, but uh, it, I forget where I was going to place that it, uh, in, but I think your point of it's going to be in ways that he had his hands tied up. They weren't relaxed at his sides. I mean, what, what were you planning on doing with that? Yeah, uh, there's, there's likely to be something else in your hand, whether if you're, if you're at the ATM, <laughs> ATM machine, your wallet, your, your cars or your phone. I and mean, a lot of people should try get a dummy phone, maybe go get a garbage broken phone and run some drills holding that in your hand. Um, why not? Everybody, everybody, everywhere I look, everybody has a stupid phone in their hand. So maybe that's a drill we should start running with people. Um, John had another one. We would take ammo boxes to the line and everybody had to stand there with their ammo box and we're just at seven yards. And then you just talk you through it. All right, open the box and everybody's doing it. All right, take the insert out, put it in your back left pocket. And then before that, you tell you on threat command, which is the beat, you're going to draw and fire three rounds at the target. Cool. And we were doing this box thing for a little minute and a half straight reading words on it, flip it over. All right, put the card, put the insert back in and beep, it happens as you're putting it in and everybody's in different stages of getting this accomplished. And you just got to drop what's here and get the gun out and go to work. Um, that was a really good thing to keep your mind off of. I'm ready. <coughs> and this times it suffered. So again, training with drills, like build drills, things like that. It isn't even something that you're going to default to that basic level of proficiency. It's that's the training that's getting you ready for that event to happen. And what happens will happen. You don't get to redo it. It's going to happen and that it, it is over. You either win, you lose, or you both lose. Um, and I scoffed that too. I'm like, the only way to make it happen quickly or end quickly is you have to get accurate, effective hits. And that doesn't mean you didn't get shot either. So who wins? 
well, if you kill the bad guy, we win. Oh, is that right? So he's dead. He's a piece of garbage. And he puts one through your gut and you got shit in a bag for the rest of your life. Um, you're no, there isn't a shooting you can get into that won't change you forever. So that, that people have to get ready for that one too. And the skill set is just the basic one, hoping you survive it. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, let's look at some of the comments here, Chris. Alan says, agree. Is answering the or discussing the point you made about being an instructor since you have to get involvement with each student and make it enjoyable in the context of your material will be relatable. A lovely bride, Miss Lisa, is on. Good morning. My jujitsu coach is on. Cody Hudson. Good morning, brother. William Rhodes is on. Gerald is on out there in Oregon. Good morning, Gerald. What, so you have a company now, Chris, uh, 532 Insight. What is that, brother? So that is my company I started. Um, I was contracting for a while with uh, teaching the breaching stuff. Um, talked to some friends who do money, like, you know, management and all that stuff. And they were all like, you are a crazy person for not having your own company. Um, you need to work under that, not as a contractor as you. Your company needs to work for them and so on to kind of protect uh it's not its sole purpose, right? It is a business, but um, yeah, I want to see what it turns into. The consulting thing kind of happened organically. Um, companies ask opinions and have them. Um, whether they have value or not is up to them to decide, but I'll give an opinion. And the training part, I just just had my very first class up in Washington, up in Wenatchee and Shalin County. I always say it wrong, Shalin, Shalin. Um, some good friends up there. Um, I learned a lot about what it's required to travel and instruct, what do I actually need to bring and what I don't. Um, and it was stuff, stuff I wish I had, but it went very well. Um, and then I've been asked around here for some open enrollment stuff, which I'm not really quite prepared or set up to do yet. I gotta, I gotta think more on that, like closed enrollment police classes. I know I'm dealing with guys who've already trained. I have a range. I don't have fees in the range. It's their range. I have all the ammo sitting out there. I know exactly what to expect generally. But an open enrollment, I'm going to have to put some more thought in how I want to do it, but that's definitely going to happen. Um, the 532, I think, is the easiest way to explain it. Um, that was my call sign on SAU. That was my favorite call sign. I had four of them, but that's the one that I was there the longest and had the most meaning to me. But it goes back. Those numbers go all the way back to, like, the beginning of my adult life as a Marine. So my boot camp platoon was 2035. Got out of boot camp, uh, became an 0352 as an MOS. Um my police academy class was th uh, 325. Um, my call sign on that was 832, or my first call sign on patrol was 832 Lincoln. Um, we should have a five in it, but still got 32. Uh, what else? Oh, my call sign in SAE was Sam 532. Um, there's a headdresses, phone numbers. Uh, my flight back from Seattle was flight 532. It's very weird. I know we can kind of see we see correlations to stuff that aren't really there, but only because we notice them. Like, you ever noticed all the white cars on the road or all the yellow cars and you only see them? But, yeah, those numbers, they make sense to me, and they just seem like they've always been there. So that's what I picked. Cool. This is a name. Uh, William is on this morning. Uh, Matt is on. Good morning, Matt. Okay, guys, let's talk about the next thing, man. This is, uh, you know, you here. you're a guy that spent, you know, the, the young part of your adult life as a Marine in uniform and service to your country, you get out of the Marine Corps and you spent the rest of your adult life in service to your, to your community as well as a law enforcement officer. So I'd ask you, Chris, what is the state of law enforcement today, man? So I thought about this last night. Um, I'm going to answer, I'm going to say two answers and I'm going to explain why I use those answers, right? Or the things you're going to hear. Um, back in my day, right, is a phrase you'll hear. You're going to hear the phrase, the job is dead. Um, you're going to hear the phrase, they don't know how good they have it, right? So let's explain them all, right? So back in my day was the late 90s. Um, there were no body cams, which didn't mean we were doing unlawful, crazy stuff. It just means we didn't have that concern. My belt literally had a gun, extra ammo, OC, because I had to have it, it was required, an expandable baton that I figured out was stupid and got rid of that later. Um, and I had two sets of handcuffs and a radio. That's it. That's all I had on my belt. All the rest of the crap was garbage. I could put my hands on people and get just enough done. And the OC was there because it was required. Um, that's the back in my day part, right? We would chase guys everywhere. We would chase cars. We would get in fights with people. We would see a guy walking down the road and it was like, I wonder what that guy's doing. And that meant you need to stop him. And we'll get into the old like, oh, what's that guy up to? Should be our first response. But 
we would go find out what they were doing. It didn't mean we arrested them all, but it was like, hey, how you doing? And if they talked to us and they were up to no good, we would find out and we'd arrest them. Or we'd remove them from society for a night and allow them, you know, so something didn't happen. Um, but then I would look back at where my dad became a cop in the, in the mid-70s. Uh, it was way harder um, compared to what I had. Way harder. Um, that's to the state of law enforcement I'm talking about where the people say the job is dead, right? Job is dead. Job will never come back. And it is dead for me. At my job, what I started that career 22 years ago, whatever it was, that type of policing is dead. And we have to evolve. The policing that my dad did in the 70s and guys did in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s is dead. It is gone. It probably isn't coming back. Um, although I bet I'm going to bet elements of it do. Um, because right now we're at a point where we have so much technology that we're trying to figure out how we can use it as an advantage, not as a limiter. Like officers should be looking at those body cameras as if you're doing your job the right way, this body cam video should be clearing up stupidity that people complain against you right like that. Um, should there be a penalty or a consequence for people who lie and try to make a complaint against an officer that's just on its face, unfounded, and only there to disperse themselves and their, or them in the career, um, I think there probably should be. Uh, you don't get to say bad things about people in public um, without being sued, and I don't think you should be able to go and complain about an officer and, and lie. Now, if people did something wrong, then I think the simplest thing we can do in law enforcement is probably switch out from what we had in the 80s and 90s where the unions were overly defending everybody. Um, people make mistakes, and that's what we have to admit. Not that they're bad. When people are criminal, they need to be dealt with and removed. But when people make a mistake, instead of saying, explaining it away, maybe we should say, hey, you messed up. Um, here's your punishment. Like, don't do that again. You understand that? Yes. And let the guy move on. Let them or the gal move on in their career. And I think you're going to find a lot of people would blossom. Um, but when you over defend them and it, it becomes a thing where management and city councils and mayors and you know, governors and the political side of the house is interfering with the police side of the house. You're just going to have dissent. Um, and if we as a police officials can accept the fact that we make mistakes. And when we do, when we get our hands smacked, it's our fault and that's okay. But that's all that's going to be held. You're not going to be, it shouldn't be a pariah for the rest of your career. Um, that's where the problem I think is where we lay, where we lie now and our problem is um, policing is not dead. It's going to keep going on. It's going to evolve. It already has. But right now we're at the exact point of nobody knows quite what to do with it. Um, people are taking over streets in Portland and parts of neighborhoods and calling it our thing. And I just don't think a, 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 a society can survive that way where you say, yeah, it's OK. It's just that small part. Well, let's move the small part by your neighborhood. Whoa, because it goes into the not my neighborhood thing. Um, until it affects people, until they realize that a part of the country who's falling apart is our country falling apart, and that that could just as easily move where you're at, and saying that it can't um, is just stupid. Like, don't tell me it can't. If 400 people came over by your house in the beautiful state of Tennessee and decided we're going to take over this 40-acre lot next to you, there's not much you could do about it. There's not um, until the entire community says we're not going to put up with this and actually went and enforced it. But if they said, ah, they're, they're not hurting anybody, they're just doing that. And every night they had music blasting, they got lights going on, they're shooting guns off, they're doing whatever they want to do. I think you would find that to be very offensive to your rights. Um, so we need to respect, I, I, I could go on. I kind of lost track. The job's not dead. It is, it is facing challenges. And its biggest challenge is that we are allowing the media, the government, all of these people to tell us that police are wrong. And then our next generation is like, I don't want to be part of that because I don't want to deal with those issues, even though they know we're not wrong. They want to be on the team, but they're like, why would I, why do I want to go get smacked in the face every day? So hiring people is actually super difficult. Quality people. Yeah. And I tell you that when I got hired with the sheriff's department right out of the Marine Corps, they had, um, I don't know if they do this now, but the city would, they had this thing called the merit council. So you actually applied to this entity <coughs> called the merit council and the merit council was comprised of like city councilmen, local attorneys, et cetera, that did this pro bono. And they would look at the application and you would interview with them. And if they like you, then they would pass you to the sheriff's department. So it, 
the sheriff's department was only getting a cohort of the applicants. That's all they would see is the one that these elected citizens thought were amazing, good candidates. So, you know, I, I think that in the evolution of policing, we're, we're going to see this. Like you said, it's dead. I was a cop in the mid, mid and late 90s. I had the same setup as you, thought the baton was stupid, left it in my, in my thing, two handcuffs, a gun, you know, that kind of stuff. Nowadays, man, I don't know if you saw this, Chris, but they want federal FBI agents and everybody's going to be um, mic'd up and video cameras and everything. Did you see that? Yeah. Um, it's, it's insane. It's insane in one sense, but let me, let me clarify that. And I want your, your opinion on this. <clears throat> You know, we, we constantly see, not constantly, but there are isolated incidents of this this uh, law enforcement officer sexually assaulted me during my DUI, DUI stop. Okay, cool. You're assigned to desk duty. We're going to launch an investigation. We do the investigation. The, the video footage completely exonerates the officer. I'm with you, Chris. We need to do something to those people. You don't just get a pass. What was the punishment that this officer was looking at? He was looking at probably years of his life in prison. Great. Now, ma'am or sir, you're looking at a similar uh, length of lengthy time in, in a prison. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think you have to look at. I'm going to answer the two parts, like the board review. The society gets the people it votes for. If that's the way that everybody's comfortable with, like until you, open, until you pull a sheet away and show society what is being done, they are just going to support it. Like, oh, it's just how it goes. I don't know how cops get hired. The cops hire. No. These people look at them first and they give them a pool to draw from and they can only get somebody out of that pool to pass. And when it, and it's even worse when people start putting pressure, well, you need to get all five of these or all 60 of these have to pass. And you're like, only 20 are worth anything. And the other, there's 10 of them that are going to be a liability, cost us money, probably end up in prison. Well, we need them to pass. I, I can't help you there if that's how your community is starting to run. Um, and it's dangerous uh, hiring people based on what you want out of them on race, religion, you know, color or skin. If you're hiring people for that fact or not hiring them for that fact, you're doomed. That is not acceptable in anything. You need the best men and women, period, regardless of what anything about them. They have to be the best. Um, the second part, remind me where the hell we're going. Um, uh, well, it, it's TC says, it, uh, he says, making a false report is illegal and in most jurisdictions, it is simply that the DAs won't charge it. Right. Um, so here's the, the sticky wicket of whatever we want. So qualified immunity, we'll just breeze off that one, right? Qualified immunity is something that's saying, hey, I'm trying to do my job the best way that I was trained, and I'm not going to be sued personally for me doing my job because I made you late for work, right? Or I, I arrested you on a traffic stop, and this happened. You can't sue me for that because I'm doing my job, and you committed a crime. Um, qualified immunity is not... I get to commit crime. I don't get to just do whatever I want. It means I'm doing the right thing and you just don't like it. That's what protects people from it. Um, the false claims, I think, go the same way. Like if I don't have qualified immunity, then you like a libel suit, right? So if you said, well, he he raped me, that's a, that is a absolutely damaging to a person's career, reputation, their family, their neighbors. Like you can't kind of unstink that. When the neighbors hear, oh, and it's never happened to me, but the neighbors hear like, oh, like he's, didn't you hear Susan's husband is on desk duty because he raped a woman on a traffic stop? And it comes out later, no, that never happened. The person lied. Mm, I don't know. Like you can't unstink that. That's a, a stain that gets on people. So does that mean I can go around suing everybody that did that? And if I did, what do they have anyway? You know, unless you have this per rich person from Beverly Hills that makes a false claim against you. You're going to get money out of it. And money, is that going to fix the reputation? The neighbor's still going to think the same thing. Um, but that punishment, like telling people it's a crime, like it's a crime to be an asshole. Like we'll find a way to make it one, but you just don't get to behave that way in public. Um, you shouldn't treat men and women like that of anything. I shouldn't treat a person walking down the street any different than I would treat my neighbor. We tell the recruits that, right? Like treat everybody with respect. Have a plan to kill them, but treat everyone with respect. And don't lie. We don't do the same thing. I don't lie to make an arrest. And that is punishable. If I lie and say, Rich, you're under arrest for freaking 400 pounds of cocaine in your garage. You're like, I don't have it. And you're like, what's this? Right? The whole planning evidence thing. No. That cop should be fired and go to jail. Like, you just, you don't do that. We're talking about like actual 
I don't know, I go on forever. Like the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution, of the United States of America is a big deal. Um, a lot of people want to say it's paper. It isn't. It is a piece of paper that holds these ideas that actually allows us to function as a society. And it's probably the most important guideline other than the Ten Commandments that you can focus on, especially as a cop. You have to respect it. No, I, I love that, man. I, I can tell my neck's going to be hurting for <laughs> agreeing with you all day, the head going up and down. Uh, guys, thanks for everybody that's joining us today live or watching on uh, Coffee with the Rich coffee with rich's youtube page or listening in a podcast to come um so much good information i don't know what i want to unpack but let's start with something that you said i want to you said everyone you meet you know you interact with have a plan to kill them i gotta i gotta unpack that um it goes to the ultimate respect thing like there's nothing even if you're responding i'm going to speak from the police side and the, the citizen side um they're the same thing so I am going somewhere, I'm interacting with a person. It should be with kindness. Like smile at people often disarms them a lot. Just be nice, like, hey, how you doing, sir? And if their immediate reaction to you is, what the fuck do you want? Well, then we've already established where we're standing with each other. Um, and I didn't start it. Um, be nice to everybody, but have a plan. How am I going to deal with this person? Like size them up the moment you see them. How am I going to deal with them? Where can I go for cover? What assets do I have that will help? But all that should just be running in the background constantly. Where, you know, you come around the corner and there's four 300 pound dudes and they give you the side eye. Probably not a good idea to get in a freaking altercation with them or even continue on your path. Might be a good idea to you turn that one up, but you can't do it as a cop. Um, so that one needs a lot of kindness, a lot of, hey, how you doing? Disarm them with some comedy. Um, I'm getting sidetracked again. Unpacking it like just be nice, but understand that if the. If this happens, if this per person threatens me, what am I justified in doing? And that all comes from training ahead of time. You better understand what you're actually lawfully capable of. And you can't just bite in the corner like a corner chihuahua. It's never, it's not going to be understood. You cannot bite out of fear. You can't, well, he, he, he reached for something. Oh, okay. Well, or he, he, he tried to punch me. Okay. Don't, don't stand so close. Learn how to fight. Um, and just because someone's acting goofy and you go and attack them because they're scaring you isn't going to be acceptable for citizens or cops. It's not a great explanation. It's not. No, I, th I think it's great. And I, one of the things that I think that uh, is maybe buried in there in that, uh, you know, having a plan is, you know, you, you know, like you said, you're sizing them up. I'm smiling. If they smile back, we're probably okay. If they're not, what are they doing with their hands, et cetera. But I've got some lines in the sand that are mentally like if, if we go this way, he puts his hand in my face. There's something I'm not going to hesitate. I'm, I'm, I'm going. And uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, like I, there are things that I have already trained to. I've thought about, I've, I've made decisions ahead of time. That's going to speed up my reaction to this other person. Um, yeah. So understand that you are, your body and your person is your most sacred thing in the world. Um, and nobody gets to put their hands on it. Um, with that caveat, like that's one of the LE things, right? Police, like you're under arrest, turn around and submit to my authority. Um, if you want to fight, then you're, you're fighting against society basically. And that's the only time they should put their hands on you, but anyone else just in an interaction. If I go to the, if I go to the store on the way to work today and I'm walking out of the convenience market on the way to the gas station, and a guy does the old, like, hey, man, you got a dollar? I mean, it's easier to say, no, sorry, I don't. Thank you, sir. That interaction right there shows you as positive. And if he wants to come up and put his hand on you, it's not acceptable. Like, you don't have to be fearful for, you shouldn't be fearful for if you react to it. It doesn't mean you should throw him on the ground and choke him out. But it absolutely means, like, you can turn to them and shove them away. And say, do not put your hands on me. I think that's absolutely justifiable. You don't get to touch people in polite society without their consent. Um, being able to react violently, if violence is coming at you, and I think we're going to talk about that later. Um, if you, a, a friend of mine, Greg, said it a long time ago, is if I'm justified in punching someone in the mouth, how hard do I hit them? As hard as you possibly can, right? Um, you don't take half measures when it comes to defending yourself, and you don't take half measures when it even comes to describing what you do not want someone to do. But the very aggressive but confident turning around to face someone and say get away from me 
I think holds a lot of water once it comes to defending yourself. Stay away from me helps a lot. Like it's very, I'm making it very clear. I don't want you touching me. I want you to go away from me. <clears throat> if you continue to do it and you actually put your hands on me, I'm going to hurt you. And then I'm going to get away. It's not a boxing match. Like we're not trying to get into that and everything shouldn't come to a gun. Like if you're, if your only answer is, well, I have my gun. I, I don't shoot that dude. Like you're better off not. You're better off shoving them and running away. If they're going to chase you, we've elevated things. Run back into the store and say, call the police. This guy's out here attacking me. Um, there's a whole lot of answers that go away from, well, let's stand there and duke it out. Or, I, you know, I'm a black belt in jujitsu. I'm going to take this guy down to the ground. Well, his three friends in the car are just going to come help him. And you can be a black belt. That's great. That's a hard That's a hard thing to deal with on the concrete out in front of the convenience market. Um, when unknown, everything is an unknown coming into it. Uh, but I think... Like training yourself physically, mentally, being understanding what you're allowed to do and that you are the most important thing and your family first, period. Other people, that's not your problem. And choosing to get involved in that, what I think we should probably talk about later, choosing to insert yourself into someone else's problem is often a bad idea. Um, if you want to be a hero, you might be stepping in the middle of something that A, is none of your business, and B, you've completely misread, um, and C, is going to get you killed. Or put you in put you in jail. Um, that's a side topic. But if it comes to yourself, man, just people have got to stand up for themselves and not shirk away from it. Like tell people straight to the face, like leave me alone. Don't do not come anywhere closer to me. And then go about their business. Just go away from that person. Yeah, that's assertiveness is a is a learned skill and is a fine line between assertiveness and aggressiveness. But to your point about uh, not letting people touch you, man, I was a brand new recruiter. And I went from being a cop, turned in my badge and gun on a Friday, went and literally went back into the Marine Corps at midnight. My orders were effective midnight that night. So Monday morning, I'm wearing a set of Deltas in a recruiting office. Now, I hadn't gone to recruiting school yet, but so I carry that same former sword officer, cop, grunt to now I'm uh, in a recruiting substation. And uh, they're like, hey, you're going to go do uh, Oliver Springs High School. You're going to go to Oliver Springs High School, do a, a setup. You're going to put your little, they taught me how to put my little brochures on the table. And I'm standing there and I got my little video thing running, showing what boot camp's like. And this kid, he comes up and he and he gets, a, I've never told this story before on air, but he, he there's an army recruiter right next to me. And he, he picks up a sticker <coughs> off the army recruiter's desk. And he peels off the sticker right in front of me. He's looking at me. I mean, he, we're right across the desk from each other. He goes, I'm going to make that uniform look good. I'm going to make it look good. And he walks around the table. And I'm like, I turn to face him. And he's coming at me. And he's got the sticker. And right as he starts to put it on my medals, on my ribbons, <clears throat> I wrist lock his ass to the ground, roll him over prone and you know, go into a cuffing position. And I'm like, go get the SRO. You know, to the other kids, go get him. He comes in, they scoop the kid up, and I'm like, and out he goes. And I'm like, well, uh, this is the end of my recruiting career. But but it wasn't because everybody saw it. Uh, you know, the, the principal high-fived me later in the office, closed door. You're, like, You're welcome here anytime. This is unacceptable conduct. Next thing you know, there's Marine Corps posters all in the guidance counselor's office. My point is, you know, there's lines, man. I'm not going to tolerate you putting your hands on me, you know, whether I'm a public servant and you pay my salary and all this other crap or not. Right. The, uh, so that's a fine line, right? That, if yeah. that was at a different school, things may not have turned out the exact same way. Um, we do need to, I, everything I think I say, anything anyone says has to be better defined, right? Like putting your hands on me is probably, I don't think it's a good idea. I'm not the toughest guy in the world by far, but just doing it out of anger or assault is not good. But like the little old lady who touches your shoulder and says, excuse me, like we can't live in a, we can't live in the world of everybody's out to get me all the time. And like, ha, ah, like elbow people. Right. Cause it's not, a, I haven't been in like my 45 years. I've never been standing there and had someone come up and just grab me and punch me in the face. I hope it doesn't happen, but I have had people go, excuse me and tap me on the shoulder or even drunk guys coming up, you know, panhandling or doing whatever, you can generally just deal with them verbally. I've never had to kick anyone's ass. I've never had to pull my gun on any of them. Um, hope that never happens. We'll get into why that's pulling your gun out. is probably the last resort. And when it does come out, you should probably be shooting. Yeah. Um, the gun is what everybody 
thinks about. Oh, I'm going to get gun training, gun training, gun training. There's so much more. Um, but yeah, like have a plan to kill them, have all that stuff is great. But 99% of the time, the world's just a nice place to be and it's not that bad. Um, but when we start to t- training, we start talking about mindsets and people take it not too seriously, but they, they take it the wrong way. They start to live in this world of paranoia that is eating their brain and their soul alive. Like you'll react. Like when it comes, you can't be in code white, right? You can't just be like, look, it's so fun. You know, oh, it's such a nice day. No, nah, the bad things happen because they generally don't happen in your comfortable environment. Um, if you're at three in the morning and you're in a place that you probably shouldn't be, that's where bad stuff happens and it's your fault for being there. Um, yeah, but like, part of- this is like whiskey and coffee at the same time. We go on for like hours. <laughs> Okay, so like I think it's part of the Marine Corps Combat Hunter program is when you enter a new environment, you know, you have the bad algorithm, right? You got the baseline plus an anomaly equals a decision. I got to make a decision. So and that decision cycle, I guess, is what I'm getting at, which is why I like front and center, have a plan to kill everybody. And I and I know that sounds maybe a little bit extreme to some of our guests, but let me let me unpack it just a bit. And I want your opinion. So if I walk into a new environment the ability to go lethal force is going to be the the highest hurdle I have to make legally, morally, emotionally, ethically, et cetera. It's going to take a lot of mental bandwidth to, to do that perhaps, right? Because there's a lot of variables involved I have to consider. So if I walk into a room, anybody need shooting in here? Okay, cool. It's just like 99.999% of every other room I ever walked into. You know, we got people playing bingo and, and it's all, it's all uh, tea and rainbows. But it, maybe somebody does need lethal force in this room. Okay, great. If I, that's the first thing I'm getting out of the way. Okay, nobody does. Good. Let's re- let's bring it down a notch. And I think it's the Combat Hunter program. But I like that approach. I think it's a pretty decent approach. So it goes to the, I don't know if it's a mindset or what, the way to think about it, right? We talked about um, like our intuition, right? I and mean, women, you aren't the only ones with intuition. Everybody has intuition. Um, any room I walk into the restaurant, I go to, I go to dinner with my wife, we walk into a restaurant and there's the thing that draws your attention, the anomaly, right? Is a guy, a drunk guy at the bar arguing with somebody has nothing to do with you, but you're aware, well, that's not normal. And that sounds aggressive over there. That's the anomaly. Probably should be aware of it. Um, if it's not someplace we have to be, is this going to go sideways and do we want to just leave now? Or it looks like it's pretty much under control and we're going to go have our dinner and we'll be separated from them anyway. But the, the side eyes, the, the weird movements, um, police officers are going to see them more because they are reacted to differently. They are the anomaly when they walk in a room. So if you look at everybody else, the way they react to you in uniform, when you walk into a room or the Starbucks or wherever it is you're going to eat um, or whatever it is you're doing, they will notice you as the anomaly. And then you're looking for how they react to you. If they just look at you and go, oh, it's a police and they look back and they go back to what they're doing, that's one thing. But if you see the guy in the corner who does the overly hideaway, like your brain's telling you right now, that dude does not want me looking at him or to even see him. Um, do I go talk to him? Or do I, am I just constantly aware of where he's at and what he's doing? Because you don't have anything to do with the guy anyway, but you walk into Starbucks, the guy looks up from whatever he's doing, he looks away, he turns away, and as you go up in the line, he kind of gets up, grabs his stuff, and heads out the door. That's obviously someone who does not want to interact with you. But is it raised to the level of, I want to follow this guy out and find out what he's doing? Um, Sometimes, sometimes not. Does it make me aware that he may come back in the door? If he does come back in the door, what what just went on there? Why? Why'd you look at me weird? Why'd you leave? Now you're back and you're going to sit down. Did you go get a gun? Did you go put away a gun? Did you go put away your drugs? Did you do everybody? We I think cops, a lot of times we overthink what the person did and we apply a scenario to it. Well, what if he went and got a gun? Okay. Who cares? Everybody has a gun. What if he wouldn't put a gun away? Nothing you do about that. Good. Doesn't have a gun. What if he pulls a gun out of him? Shoot him. I, like we, we what if these things to death and the answers are actually always pretty simple. What if someone attacks me? Fight them. Take them into custody. What if he shoots at me? Shoot him. Uh, what, what if this? What if that? No, don't worry about it. Um, but I got sidetracked again. No, the, and that's what I love now. about you, Chris, man. That's why. I- I love about you, man. I like, I listen to it. Please go back. I encourage you for those of you that are watching this one of the 25 folks that are watching live, go back and listen to two fourteen. I love how this isn't complicated, man. 
If he pulls a gun, points at you, shoot him. There's no, there's not. What do you want to do? Give him a hug? I mean, come on, man. Yeah, we over, we overthink a lot. Cops do, civilians do. Um, but back to the anomaly thing, like the civilian, if at, if in just plain clothes, I am a civilian. There's no policemen, police officers, police women. We're not different than the the, local, the normal citizens in our community. We're all the exact same people. One of them just gets paid to do a job and wear a uniform, and that's it. So we're generally the anomaly when we walk into places. If you, as a citizen, walk into a place and find yourself to be the anomaly, like everybody's acting weird, right? Um, if they're not quite hip to your walking into the place, you are the anomaly, and you should be aware of that. Um, what was the old, it was like Animal House where the guys walk into the door of the bar and the record goes, Rrr! and they kind of look around. It's time to go. I went to a bar in Palm Springs like that once. And we walked in and it was like, ah, I don't fit. I don't know what's going on here, but I don't feel right. Um, the But recognizing that and then recognizing other people's interaction with you is what's important. Um, and you actually have to pay attention to it. We're, and I, I, you know, give credit where credit is due, but I can't remember who came up with this originally. I just know a lot of us have parroted it. Um, like when you walk out, we talk about you walk out of the grocery store and you see the guy in the parking lot who gives you the creeps, right? Like, oh, what is that guy doing? It's because he's creepy. 100%. He is creepy, and that is why he gives you the creeps. You have to trust that intuition and pay attention to it. It is not, don't worry about offending people. That is the most BS thing that's been pushed in society. Oh, that's very offensive. You don't, you don't like him because he's black or Asian or white and he's homeless. You don't like him because he's a homeless guy. You think, yes, he's dangerous. Something in my brain and women, you're the worst at blowing it off. Something in my brain is telling me that he is not safe for me and that I am going to go back and I'm going to go back in the store and ask for someone to walk me to the car. I am going to get back in the store and call on the phone, do whatever it is, or go wait five minutes till they leave. But ignoring things like that is when the bad thing happens, when we get to the parking lot. I think you're freezing up a bit, Rich. Or is that me? Yeah, I, I, it's one of us. It's probably me, man. I live out here in the middle of nowhere. You know, as far as situational awareness, you know, to your point, Chris, that we we overcomplicate that. I've heard everything from keep it on a swivel. Okay, what? What does that mean? Uh, count everybody with that has a hat on. Who gives a shit? It's like we have this this thing that other animals don't have, and that's the ability to put the current state uh, that we're looking at into a future state. You know, a little time travel machine between our ears. And I think the easiest thing to do is 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 use that intuition, like you said, Chris. And what is the future state of this creepy guy? Yeah. So I'm not sure if I. I think you might have been frozen again, Chris. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Your video's going a little sideways. Maybe someone in chat can let us know. You there, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> it oh. wouldn't be coffee with Rich without some video glitch. So the paying attention to the environment, it doesn't matter the environment. If it's your home environment, like your town, your city, and you're always going around, everything that's normal, it, the normal, the wave, the baseline, right, is constant. The baseline's here. And when you see, if you see a guy wearing a clown outfit with devil horns at the Starbucks, you're going to pay attention to that because that's not normal. Like, what is that? But if it is, and that guy's there every morning, he's irrelevant. He is not, he's not an anomaly. Um, when you travel out of town and you go to another place, it doesn't matter where you go. It could be the worst part of that, wor the worst part of the town and the worst part of the city. It doesn't matter. If you pop up at a taco stand in LA and everybody just kind of looks normal for that environment, Everybody's doing their thing. There's no spikes of yelling or just nothing's giving you the, you're on your radar being creepy. It's because nothing is. Now, it may develop that way. And if people start to pay a little too much attention to you, you just have to be aware of it. But the baseline is there for everybody in every single environment, and you can usually pick it up pretty quick. You don't need to sit here and be the paranoid one because then you start to stand out. But as you just walked into a room, it doesn't matter and trust yourself, you'll be aware of the weirdness. Um, it sound, I think it's too easy to say that, but you will be, you are aware of the, weir the weirdness. And when it goes, look, if your attention's drawn to something, you should pay attention to it. But it, like guys that do, you know, you see work or undercover stuff, if you go in looking like a cop, looking around all the time, they're gonna peg you as either a cop or you're a bad guy or you're doing something wrong. Um, Cause that's how everybody acts who's up to no good and isn't sure of themselves in their environment. Um, 
just trusting the fact that you can walk into a Starbucks and if nothing is peeking on your radar, it's probably fine. Um, doesn't mean you can sit there and pick your nose and not worry about the world because you're always worried about things, not worried, but aware of things coming in. You should look outside every once in a while, see if there's any weird cars, but it's, it doesn't need to be a paranoia in your life. Like just be you and you will be aware of the weird things. Yep. Spot on. And I think that kind of bleeds into mindset too. And, and you know, Chris, for those of you that have somebody just shared us and you're coming on in the middle of it, you know, Chris has been involved in over 20 officer involved shootings, fired his weapon four times and in, in those shootings. So, uh, you know, obviously you have a mindset I've trained with you. I've been around you before. Uh, I know obviously you do possess it and I want you to, to break down to the audience and those listening, man, what does it mean? How can you achieve it? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, just to clarify, I've been present in 20 shootings where like someone next to you shot someone or you've right. entered a room and someone has shot or they've shot from the window. Um, but I've only had to shoot in big and four shootings. Okay. Um, the mindset, uh, I think it's a, it, it's not a confidence thing. It isn't training like it helps, but it's like a, it's an awareness of what you're actually capable of and not being overly confident. Um, the guy who's, who's, thinks you know, they got this Punisher skull and they think they're the ultimate warrior um, is generally the easiest one to put on a line and find out they barely shoot or they're competent barely. Um, the guy who's always looking around over his head and looks paranoid is easy, usually an easier target. Um, that's the shoot me first guy, right? The guy with the photo vest and he's always looking around, shoot that guy first. Um, mindset's its own thing. Like I think you're going to get more out of, I think you'll be more successful educating yourself on what you're legally, morally, and justified to do than becoming expert with a handgun. Um, because most people aren't going to have to shoot somebody. M many people will have to talk their way out of a situation. Uh, fewer of those are going to have to get in a physical altercation. And the very slimmest of margins are actually going to get where guns come out justifiably and have a gun fight, right? Um, there's a big difference between gun fights where two people are trying to kill each other or a bunch of people are trying to kill each other and one person is just being shot. Um, my, yeah, mindset is deep. It's a confidence thing. You're training. The biggest confidence is what am I allowed to do? What am I justified in doing? And am I willing to do it? And do I have to do it? Could I shoot this guy right now? Okay, yes, you can. Can I run away? I don't see anything stopping you. Probably a better option. What if he chases me? Shoot him. Keep running. Run faster. Uh, getting involved in the shooting is what should be is what should be avoided at all costs. And that comes from that, uh, like John says, that transitional space. If I'm leaving the convenience store and I see guys sitting on the hood of my car at the gas pumps, well, that'll make you mad. But what value to your Overall life is having you walk out into the parking lot and ask that dude, hey, what are you doing sitting on the, on the hood of my car? If he's like, oh, I thought it was my friend's car, and he walks away, great. But if he goes, hey, man, let me talk to you. I can tell you right now, the hey, man, dude, has no good intentions for you ever. They do not, they're not, they don't have the winning lottery numbers. Uh, whatever scheme they've got running is a scheme. Um, be aware of that. Like even the hey, man, you got some change. That's that slow intro to find out what kind of victim you are, period. And if you are the meek, shy victim and you're not just willing to look him in the eye and go, no, sorry, man, I don't have anything. Thank you. And walk on. They don't want to mess with that dude or girl. But like, oh, if you do that or you open your purse and you want to give him money, that's just waiting to get snatched. And that's my opinion is what they all want to do. They're just varying levels of people. They're actually willing to do it during time of day. Depends on what cars are in the parking lot. But the hey, change dude is not a good, not a good person who's down on their luck and needs some change. The hey, change dude is someone who has chosen to live that lifestyle, not because they were in prison because they screwed up before and the government messed them up. It is because they choose to live that way and they don't want to do more. We're not holding anybody back in this society. Yeah, I, love I love it. Like you said, that mindset is deep and uh, you took us in several different directions. I want to, I want to talk about a couple of them, Chris. I come out of the convenience store one time to your point. I was laughing or smiling when you were talking about the guy sitting on the hood of your car. 
I, I don't try to bring attention to myself. I, I dro- At this time, when I was in the, a Marine Corps officer, I drove a piece of crap 1994 Honda Accord. And uh, it's rusted and it's got no air conditioner because I'm saving my money. I'm getting ready to retire. And this, uh, there's a bunch of Hispanic males hovering around my car. And I come out and uh, the, the guy's like, hey, Hey, orderly, man, you know, those are nice rims. And I know they're not nice rims. It's a piece yeah. of crap car. So I'm like, there's something else going on here. And it ain't talking about my rims. So, uh, you know, in, instead of being like, you know, oh, yeah, get the hell with my car. It was like, hey, man, wh- that's cool, brother. Do you have a, an Accord? Do you know about these engines? And, yeah, they're, they're pretty fast. And we had a great conversation. And, and it was nothing, you know. They're like, yeah, my brother's got a car like this. And it was it was nothing. They were a group of painters and we had a nice conversation. They got in their van and drove away. They wanted to know if I wanted to sell that car. They were going to make one of those little fast and furious things. So like you said, Chris, not everything is, I got to go high order on everything, right? (laughs) To your point too, about a little old lady touching you doesn't get the same level of force, man. As a bouncer, you're in a a tight nightclub. People are bumping into you and, and I'm five foot nine. So, you know, I'm not one of these big bouncers that my head is above the crowd. I have to be able to maneuver through a crowd and recognize a polite nudge, you know, while somebody's dancing with their girlfriend and a, somebody who's uh, shoulder checking me, right? There's a completely different and a completely different attitude that goes with it. Skill set, uh, uh, to your point about mindset, you, you may have said something like this. It sounded like you were talking about a quiet confidence that comes from a lot of competence. Am I overstating that? No, I think that's a better way. Yeah, that's the way to say it better than I did. Um, and I think that goes to the dudes on your car. So these guys are all hanging out by your car. Uh, they wanted to jack you for your keys, in theory. But because you came out and you're like, hey, what's up? Da, da, da. They're like, we're not going to mess with this dude. He's not, he ain't scared of us. This is not going to be easy. Let's just talk to him. I'm bored with him. Let's get out of here. Um, but if you'd come out and be like, oh, you know, I've got that. And they're like, hey, man, they could distract you with something. But you, it's that confidence where you're, you're just like, oh, hey, how are you guys doing? That is not who someone wants. That's not what the predator's trying to eat, right? All of these people are predators. Not all of them. They are. They're all predators. The people that behave in that manner yep. are predators. They are looking for the weakest link. They are looking for the limping impala. My friends make jokes about that. Like, oh, oh, it's the one limping around. That's the easy one. They don't want the super strong, healthy one because that's just going to be a pain in the butt. And they don't want to pain in the butt. They don't want to be delayed. They just want easy, easy pickings. Um, they're not weak. If you force them into a confrontation, they will fight you and they will do what they need to do. But that's not what they want. They want the easy one. So by coming out and saying, oh, yeah, you know about this? It's pretty cool, right? And they're just, it disarms them like, crap, this dude, he ain't scared of us. Now we got to, now if I don't want to deal with him, man, he's probably freaking crazy. And that's sometimes a good thing to have on your side. Um, Dude, I got sidetracked again, man. It's early. Well, well I want to, your uh, TC, Dr. TC Fuller, retired FBI, you know, he's got the old gray man uh, YouTube channel, but he said, Rich Brown, the gray man. And one of the things I like about you is I could take Chris Palmer, shave off that beard, put you in a suit, and suddenly you would look right at home as an executive. Or I could catch you out and you'd look right at home in the back of a tack van. And I think that uh, if you could talk to, that ability to be gray when and if the time is reasonable and necessary, maybe in your neighborhood enforcement team that you were on. Can you unpack that a little bit, Chris? I think so. Um, I think the easiest way to describe that to me is don't play a part. Don't um, you're the, you're the new guy in the SWAT team. You're the new cop. You're the new, you know, trained citizen. You went to your class. Um, There's nothing against these companies, these clothing companies, um, the style of dress, but everybody knows who you are. Like, you know, that back in you know the early 2000s, the 5'11 pants and the polo, like cop, right? Cop. Um, the grunt style shirt, it's like the affliction dude. Like, oh, I got my affliction shirt on, you must be a black belt. No, that's probably the easiest dude to beat up. Um, don't dress to play a character because you're putting out the vibes of a character who's at a higher skill level than you. I think if you're most guys that are at that ultimate skill level, I'm not it, but most dudes that are up here are not dressing that way. They're not wearing their cry multi-cam pants to the gas station, I hope. And, you know, getting gas because that's what they're wearing at the range. I've trained with some of the 
most talented tip of the spear dudes in the world. And it was literally like, all right, it's time to train. We open our boxes up. They throw all their uniform on, all their kit, helmet, all the stuff, get the guns. We go through, we break a bunch of stuff and take all the crap off. Everybody puts flip flops and board shorts on for the debrief. And then they go about their business afterwards. Um, drink a beer, head out and just look like some dude. Like, yeah, I mean, that's that everything. That everything has so many layers. There's no right answer for it. But not sticking out goes with not trying to be somebody you're not. Um, if you're a, a 55 year old uh, black male um, who lives in the Northeast, uh, just be you. Like you already know who you are. And if you if you start getting training and you you start to change the way you dress and act because you really like it and it's exciting. You're just doing yourself a disservice. Like all the skill sets do not change based on what you wear, how you act. Um, the how you act part can defend you later, but trying to be, like we said before, the guy who comes in and starts looking at everybody, everyone that it does matter that's bad already recognizes you as the main problem. And they're either going to want to piss you off or do something, want to start a fight with you, or they're going to recognize that, all right, this dude's here. Let's see what, if I do this, this might happen. This not, um, I've heard the exact argument of people going, I want people to know I'm a cop. One of my friends said that I don't want people to know I'm a cop. But why? Like, well then they're not going to do anything. They're not going to do this and that, but they, yeah, they might. Um, if you're just invisible, I just feel like that's a better way to go about life. Like being invisible, maybe not to the pretty girl you love, but you can, you can flash your flowers and do whatever you want on the side for that. But in general life, just being another dude or another woman is a safety thing. Um, and then being confident and showing that you're not the little weak. I hate sheep and sheep dogs. I ain't one of them. Um, but you're not just a victim. Like, don't be a victim. If you have your head up and you're just going about your business, even if you're dopey and smiling, when your head is up and you're doing normal things, people are less likely to victimize you. When you're scared and you show it by crouching down your shoulders and putting your head down and just trying to get from point A to point B, people recognize that as weakness. And that is the easiest person to stop. Hey, can I ask you a question? Uh, and they don't want to offend. Um, it just seems like those traits go together. The head down trying to get from point A to point B is the person that doesn't want to offend anybody either. The head up, even if they're giggling, really doesn't care what you're up to because they're happy in their life. And that's less likely to someone to mess with them. Um, I don't know, man. I talk too much. Not talking too much at all, man. It's all good stuff. I hope everybody's paying attention. Uh, one of the things you mentioned in your first appearance on show 214, which I've mentioned several times, is speed, surprise, and violence of action. Um, <laughs> can you talk about that? Not necessarily as it relates to a SWAT operator, but maybe those that are listening to us today. Is there a correlation for the civilian defender, Chris, or is it something that only you know, an operators need to know about? No, because it's, it's all the same thing that lets you win. Um, taking it to the SWAT side of the house, when the bad guy votes and he causes the mayhem that you react to, you're behind the curve, right? You're already behind it. Um, the speed, surprise, violence of action part is is cliche in a lot of things, but this, the armed civilian, the citizen defender, whatever you want to call them, once they decide to act, they have to act. And that's what actually takes dudes by surprise. The guy, two dudes come around the corner and be like, hey man, let me have your wallet. It, we're already past. Let's talk. All right. You may be able to, and it's probably a better idea not to get shot. If you want to give up, your, like I would rather here, dude, there's my wallet, man. Cool. 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 You, that may not be where it ends. If they do and they take it and run away, I think that's a massive win. And you've got to not let your ego be involved in it at all. But when it comes time and you're like, I can't be pushed any further. I think this is very bad. Uh, hey, come get in the alley. Come over here by the guard. No, that's bad news. Um, but that's when that speed surprise violence action goes and you will put people back on their heels. But like I'm saying, like, that is the point where you're like, I think these dudes are going to hurt me. You either turn and run quickly speed as fast as you possibly can violence, right? Or su surprise, I'm gone. And then you're running as fast as you can. If they want to chase you, you're going to have to deal with that and try to run to cover. Um, but it's just the same mindset. It's like, it is time to act now. You have to do it immediately, violently, and just without any, don't hold anything back. Like a sharp punch to the nose or a palm heel to the nose of somebody and then run is pretty surprising when they didn't expect it to come from you, right? If you're the, and I hate using things like this, but other people envision the same thing. You're five foot six, um, female and 115 pounds. 
and the six foot dude is 200 pounds, comes around the corner and he's like, Hey, that's a nice person. You know, give me your purse. And he grabs your purse says, get over here to the alley. That's not good. You don't ever go anywhere. Um, and you just reach out, smack and run. That is surprising that that's going to happen to people, but it can't be punch. And here we are going to go toe to toe. Like the surprise is I'm hitting you and I'm running away and it has to be hard and it has to be violent. And everything that occurs after that, when the hands go on you has to be the most, like they're made of lava, the most violent thrashing you can possibly do with all the power of your being is where all the energy and the violence has to come. Violence doesn't mean I'm shooting you because that's violent. Violence is in movement, in action. Um, a hand on your arm gets pulled away from with just violence. And I wish people could experience it more because they have to. Um, if you had an have an opportunity to go and train with like the bobs you guys use or a punching bag or like a heavy bag or in the mat somewhere, go to a gym and let everybody take their elbow and hit something as hard as they can. Show them how to do it so they don't hurt their shoulder, but show them like what it feels like to actually use that energy or throw a 200 pound dummy on top of them on their stomach and say, get up. And they'll put, if they push slow and they try to scoot out, no, like explode, like get angry and push them back on the ground, like get angry and watch people actually get angry and violent. That's what they have to experience. Like I do it with my daughters all the time. I can mess with them. They don't get angry, angry, but I'm like, I'm not gonna let you up. And they're like, ah, and then finally they're like, and they're like hitting you hard. And it's like, ah, and then you laugh and get up. But I want them to experience that like full power, explosive violence is what you're putting on people. And violence can be in words too, right? like screaming at the top of your lungs. And it doesn't have to be like, ah, but like deep, like get away from me, like get away from me and screaming is violent. And it can be, but it should be. Um, the surprise, that's surprising and it's all those things. But when something's unexpected, that's what all that means. It's not expected, right? If you have a cup of coffee, throw it in their face. If you just have a closed bottle of water, throw it at them, watch them catch it while you're running. Like surprise goes a long way to do stuff. Um, I mean, shit, telling them a funny story, like, Hey, you want to hear a joke and tell them a story surprising, right? And you can actually disarm people with that. It goes down. There's so many rabbit holes of what ifs that can be said about all of it, but it needs to be taken away from the cliche of hut, hut flashbang, which isn't done half the time. Right. Um, <laughs> to just life, like surprise, you know, like, Oh, I can't remember. We were in class with a guy, but like, you want to surprise somebody like for guys at the urinal, like go to the urinal, stand next to someone and be like, you know, like just look over and go, nice watch. What? <laughs> like do that. Cause that's actually pretty funny. Right. Yeah. Surprise the shit out of people. And they're like, you're an idiot, but do that to your friends. Like stand at the urinal and look over, just kind of look over them at the face and go, nice watch. And they're going to look down and be like, how are you looking at my watch? Mm. But I don't know. No, that's great, man. Uh, you know, I, I, rem I saw the movie collateral and I hate to talk about Hollywood, but there's a scene in there where, Tom Cruise draws his firearm. He's like red light, you know, just something like that. That's a little bit like, well, you know, like you said, or telling a joke. Uh, but I, one of the other things it's, it's, you said there's so many roads to go down or so kind of situational and contextual and, uh, uh, or learn violence, go to a dojo, hit something, you know, those are all great things. And I remember like, the, the, you talked about in your other show too, shit magnets, you know, this guy, everywhere he goes, crap happens to him. It's like, well, is it the situations he puts himself in or is it him? And what I mean by that, and maybe you can unpack this a little bit. <coughs> these guys, it's, there was one guy that bad stuff kept happening to him. He was not, uh, he didn't have any good combative. So I said, let's go to the multi-purpose room and let's work on this. I said, I want you to show me how, what were you doing to that guy when he punched you in the face? And he grabs my arm to put me and arrest me. And it was like a, a five-year-old little girl grabbing me. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You're grabbing a freaking violent inmate in a pod. You need to grab them with purpose. I'm not saying you got to hurt them. I'm not slamming anybody. But when they need to be, they need to know that a, a full-grown man just put their hands on them. So that, you know, it, it deters more problems than it creates. Would you agree or am I out of bounds on that? No, that's two parts. So it absolutely does. Um, if you put your soft, gentle hands on me, that tells me that you're soft and gentle and guys will test you. They'll just yank it away. And if you do it again, I, I don't have to respect you at all. Like it is, I think it goes to the primal thing. Like 
the, the silverback gorilla gets respect because it smashes around and punches people in the face. And everybody's like, I can't beat him up. He's in charge. That's not what we do as a society. It's not how we run. But the elements are there. Um, excuse me. The, but yeah, the, that part, being gentle with people, um, can, be, can be done firmly, right? You can still be firm and gentle. But when I put my hand on you, it's like, it's on there. I'm not causing pain because then we push past it. We push to, I respect that level and Al, you're hurting me now. I'm going to punch you in the face That's if it right. goes on too long. Um, but the shit magnet part is the same for cops as it is for society. Yep. Man, I'm always getting into this. I'm always getting into trouble. I'm always getting into fights. That's you. It isn't even the place you went. It's 100% you because you were there. Well, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to worry about it. Nope. It's the bar. It's two o'clock in the morning. Everybody's drunk and you're an asshole. So everybody wants to beat you up when you're the cop. And I was kind of a shit magnet. Like we would drive around and it's like, I wonder what's down this alley. Get out of the car, walk down the alley. Guys by a dumpster. What are you doing? Oh, he gets up running. I chase him. And then that's where you got to ask yourself like, so what were you going to do with him when he caught him? I don't know, but I got him. And then we'll figure out why he's going to jail later. But those things that you get involved in, the officer who they, you know, they call a shit magnet. He's out there. If they're actively out hunting and getting into stuff, they're likely to get into stuff. The people who avoid it and just sit back and wait are less likely to get into stuff. Um, the likelihood is equal for the radio call when that, when they both get there and they both go to their separate radio calls, who flips the coin when it's going to just go sideways and you had no vote in that. Uh, we had a recent one that was that way. Um, officer pulls up, the dude walks out, starts shooting at him. Oh, didn't expect that. Didn't expect that. Now I got to deal with it. Guy in the alley. Didn't expect that. Got to deal with it. Um, there's a bunch of stuff about that one. I would talk. There's a whole, there's a bunch of crap. Um, but yeah, the shit magnets are the people who are always getting into stuff. It is their fault, generally. It isn't society. It isn't, it isn't karma. It's you're in dumb places doing dumb stuff that generally you should expect that to happen to you. Um, if you would just go do your work and go home, like 99% of the people in the world would never deal with any of this. And they go like, How, why does all this happen? I'm glad it never happens to me. Maybe we should learn something from them. Like maybe getting liquored up and hanging out at the corner store, right? Selling dope is a likelihood you're going to get in some trouble either with the police or someone else who wants to sell dope there. Um, being in a gang banging generally going to get you into trouble. Um, all the innocent people that caught in the crossfire of that there's no answer for us to fix it other than find and cut out those cancerous bad guys, but you can't do that and be nice at the same time. Um, obey the constitution, find the bad guys, arrest their ass is the way that that should work. But that's another side tangent. Did I, did I even answer that question correct? I oh, yeah. Yeah. You're doing a great job. Hey, uh, I'm going to really shift gears here, Chris. And well, what advice would you give Chris Palmer, the young Chris Palmer, starry eyed on his first day as a newly sworn law enforcement officer? What advice would you give that guy? Uh, shut up. Just shut up and learn. Uh, you don't know everything. You never will know everything. Um, save all your money, like as much as you possibly can save your money. That goes for everybody. If you can save it, put it away. I would absolutely tell them that. Um, but shut up. Uh, don't try so hard. Um, no, like the, the radio calls will always be there. You can't answer them all. Crime guy and bad guys will always be there. You can't arrest them all. Um, don't put yourself in situations that cause others to have to get involved in a bad situation themselves to rescue you. Um, and don't put yourself in situations that complicate things that should have been simpler. Um, like learning how to, like, I, I wasn't a bully, but I would, I was like, you know, come here. And I, if somebody was ran, I was chasing them. Um, you kind of learn over time to be like, what value? Like, what are we arresting them for? And if we are arresting them, we should say that right off the bat. Hey, you're under arrest. No, I'm not. They run that. We'll go get them. And even that, that, sometimes it's okay to just be like, screw this. Whatever. Um, he left. He was just transient trespassing. It's like, okay. I don't know why I'm chasing that dude. Um, old me would not do that. But yeah, be quiet and listen more is a good one. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with that. I, I was the same way, man. I was honor graduate and president of my Corrections Academy class. You know, uh, and then I, I go to the police academy, honor grad and, and uh, president of that class. 
but I went there with a the mindset, man, as I remember, as I'm driving into the parking lot, uh, I'm an average white guy at the time. Me and my wife lived in a trailer on the side of a hill. You know, I drove, a, I didn't even have a vehicle. I had to borrow a vehicle to get to the Academy. So I'm starting from zero, right? I've got a high school education and just barely holding on to, you know, and I'm like, but I'm coming out of this Academy. Number one, how am I going to do that? Well, again, going back to mindset, I pulled in the parking lot. I saw the parking lot. The, the spaces were numbered. So I saw that there's somebody in spot number one. That's my spot. So very politely, very kindly, I went, hey, man, who's who's driving a, a green Honda Camry? It's got a tag number. Oh, that's you. Do you. Can you do me a favor? You're in my spot. Can you move that car? And then I just started, like I said, not necessarily bullying, but being uh, <coughs> on assertive, aggressive to get my way. And I, I was the same way, man. Uh, I was very confident too much so cocky as a young 20 something year old aggressive guy fell into some of the same traps would run through the door to get punched in the face. <laughs> you know, and I think now as a 50 something year old guy, I'm much more slow and deliberate. Can you talk about that, Chris, that evolution yeah, just, of your career, man? You just kind of figure it out over time. I think we all do. Um, well, a lot of the guys will say like, I'd rather pull the reins on some people. Oh, oh, that and have to whip them and try to get them to work. But you, that goes into like supervision and stuff. Like you got to pull the reins on some people. I needed the reins pulled on me often, very often. Um, but I had super good, excellent supervisors. Um, one of the guys actually one time asked me, he's, I chased a car again, got him, caught the dude. All he was doing was donuts in the parking lot on private property. So I don't know what I'm going to do with him in actual pursuit, but I chased his ass. And I got him to finally pull over and bail out and chase him, caught him. And boss shows up and he's like, what did I tell you about chasing cars? And that's exactly how he said it. And I said, uh, you told me not chasing boss. And he goes, okay, got it. Now I got it. Roger that. I can tell you're not happy and I'm going to chase cars, but I'm going to have a better reason next time I do it. Um, and the lesson was learned right there. So didn't, I didn't get in trouble. I didn't have anything bad come down, but I had a pursuit for no freaking reason whatsoever. Um, luckily, no crashes or damage happened, but it was for doing donuts in a parking lot. But for me, I'm like, I can't do that. And then now you're going to run for me? Oh, hell no. Um, it's a prey drive, start, man. It's instinctual, right? It's just right. But you start to figure it out. You're like, you, you learn that all the what ifs are bullshit, right? So I remember when they came out with a pursuit policy saying, you, you, thou shalt not pursue. Thou shalt not pursue if unless you know, the hand unto thy eyes, I, I, I grant thee permission. Um, everybody was up in arms. Oh, bad guys are going to get away there. Everybody's going to get out of here and they're all going to escape. And what if he, what if he bails out and goes into a house and kidnaps a family? Shoot him. Like, when does that happen? Like, so the guy, you know, most likely the dude just got a spend a license or he's drunk. Who knows what it is? We sure as hell don't know what it's for. And he's running. He knows, right? But we don't. So does our chasing him with him going hundred miles an hour through society benefit society or does it benefit our ego and us wanting to not lose? And that hundred percent of the time it's us not wanting to lose. There are rare exceptions to that. Prey drive has benefit um, where the person is so dangerous to society that we must apprehend them. But if we're going to use that phrase, right, we must apprehend them. Then we shouldn't chase them forever. We should apprehend them. Like we need to crash that car. We need to interdict that vehicle. They're so dangerous. We should be interdicting that vehicle and stopping them. Other than that, like, especially for just traffic violations, I've seen way too many fatal wrecks, um, even involve pursuits, um, not pursuits, cops getting crashes and pursuits more than the bad guys do because they're all trying to come rescue them because they're the one with the answer, right? Oh, I got to be there from 18 miles away. I'm the guy with the answers. I'll save the day. Wreck. No sense. Um, yeah. Like just, don't buy into the bullshit. What ifs? Well, what if a guy did that? If he does, then we'll deal with it. Well, if we let him do that, we let him do that. No, you didn't. He did that. We didn't cause him to do it. We didn't allow him to do it and we didn't do anything. He chose to do it. And now we'll have to deal with it. We'll figure it out. But most oftentimes we can make things worse by inserting ourselves and keeping ourselves involved in things that don't really require it. It's for the greater good of the community. It really just benefits our ego. We don't want to lose. Yeah, I, t I hope everybody heard that this morning. And I know there's a lot of current and retired law enforcement officers watching us live this morning, Chris. And 
I remember like, you know, look, it's Pookie and Ray Ray. We know who they are. We know where they live. They're going to be at their mama's house in a little bit. You know, wh why are we going to chase them through this school zone and put anybody at risk driving on a suspended, you know, what, what, what's going on here? Okay. They, 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 they hit the gas instead of the brakes, man, let them go. We'll, we'll pick them up later. <coughs> Relax, you know? Uh, but sometimes it goes the other way. Right. And it's, uh, and if the, and those are easy decisions to your point, Hey man, what if, okay, when, when we show up to get them at their mama's house later and they want to pull a gun, we got a solution for that, which, which kind of leads into the next point, And that is, I think there's a line between law enforcement officers, training tactics, et cetera, procedures, and then the armed citizen or civilian defender, whatever label we want to put on those folks. What are some of the differences and similarities that you see, Chris? So I think, I think we're both armed citizens, right? I'm armed as a job requirement um, and paid to do very specific tasks that every other citizen isn't expected of, but we're all, we all have the right to do. So the expectation is probably the only big difference. Law enforcement officers are expected to do these certain things and the armed citizen, which we both are just armed citizens, um, the civilian defender, the, you know, the concealed carrier isn't expected to do, but it's still lawful and able to do. Really, that's the only difference is the expectation that officers will be involved in it and they will not run away. They, if, it, if they're required to act, there is no duty to act either. This is, there's so many roads we can go down. Um, there's no duty to act. No one says that you have to save someone's life. You just have to have the moral uh, attitude that that's your, that's your purpose, not your job. But my purpose is to go in and be the one that fights. If you don't have that purpose, then it's probably not the best job for you. But that's another sidetrack. Um, the only real difference between the two, both are armed citizens. One has a job requirement that they can't not be involved. They're dispatched there, no different than the pizza delivery man. He has to deliver the pizza. He can't choose whether or not he wants to or else to get fired. He has to deliver the pizza. Um, we have to show up and deal with it the best that we can. And everything that we do when we deal with it, it is for the better good of all society, not our ego. It's not to fix their problem. It's to go, we as Americans expect this type of thing to be done this way. We've all kind of agreed on it. Here's what we're going to do. And the cops are just there to do it the best that they can. And the training that they give, they're given, um, the mentorship they have continuing, um, and then the way that society interacts with them is what's really going to determine where that road goes. Because it's up, everybody gets to vote. We have to show up. If we say, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Are we cool? And cops just leave like 90% of the time, way more than that. Public's interaction with law enforcement officers deal with nothing, not even physical contact. In rare cases, there's physical contact. And when you think about the overall interaction, there's physical contact. That's where, where cops are required to do it. And then lethal and like higher level force ones are the smallest sliver of the smallest sliver of percentages. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but that's really the only difference is the expectation that it will get done. Private citizen had, there's no expectation of them to be involved. They're not dispatched to anything. They may insert themselves in it, but even remaining in it isn't expected of them. So that's, that's really all I see the difference is we're all just citizens. I'm armed. You're armed. I have a job to do that I'm required to do. You just may choose to do it. Yeah, well said, man. What are some of your, hey, you spent, I think, how many, 13 years as a SWAT operator full-time? 13. Been on thousands of uh, high-risk warrants, et cetera. From, your, from that time of your life, what are some of the hard-won lessons that you took away from it that may have some relevance to those watching and listening this morning? We had a lot of hard-won lessons. Um I kind of want to break it down that kind of fits everybody. Uh, so you'll have training and training without purpose, like training without a why and understanding where you're doing it and then testing it is where we find out if it all works or not. So I've been on thousands of search warrants. Um, I used to make the joke, like I could have done every single search warrant I've done, except for like five of them, just naked. I could have gone in there with like a, like an orange stick and a flag on it 
and like a party favor and I could have directed everybody around and it would probably been the same exact thing because nobody wanted to oppose us. Nobody, nobody chose to oppose us. And people can argue, well, it's the tactics we use and it's the, the manner in which you address. Nah, they don't want to die for their drugs. They're going to be out a day or so. So stop, I, like people overthink like it's the tactics we use and it's this and that and the speed surprise. Run. So that's what makes these people, that's what makes these so successful. And I'll counter it going, uh, no, they just voted not to get involved with you. Maybe it was a tactics, maybe it wasn't. Probably wasn't. Like this dude don't want to get in a shooting. He don't want to shoot you. He just wants to get, he just wants to go about his business and he got caught. Um, the ones who do oppose us, obviously we're using the same tactics and they chose to oppose us. So therefore bullshit, right? Your tactics are helpful. They make you more likely to succeed. They are not the reason you succeed. We've been shot at through the door on a few occasions, shot at through the walls. Um, bad guys vote. They're like, that's cops. Stay away, stay away. That spray through the walls is usually like fearful, like stay away from me. Um, and what does it do? We go like, crap, we're getting shot at. Let's back up. Um, we, had, we used to have people that would say like, oh, if we know where the shots are coming, we're going to take the fight to them. That's just a bad idea. Like go deep in the house. He's shooting at you through the walls. Go find the guy shooting at you. Right. Because you're, you're going to flashbang him and it's going to be like, you know, oh, the bang went off. Like, the dude's already made a mental connection with the gun. And he's already firing it. You're not stopping that. I don't care what you do. You have to shoot him to stop that or he runs out of ammo. Um, you can make the guy flinch a little bit, but finding a guy hiding in a closet, shooting at you through the walls, through the front the door, isn't always the boogeyman in the corner for the, the officers who do you know room clearing stuff. It's not always the boogeyman in the deep corner. He may be straight away with the door, shooting at you through the door as you come to the door defeat that you got to get to the door to open it to bang it and the bang is just going to make him flinch and he's just going to keep shooting um we put a lot of like we overdo our we overview our abilities like we're almost superhuman and we're not um you, when you're actually opposed by a bad guy that's when you're going to find out if your tactics work if your training can be relied on and if you're doing the right thing uh and it's not a knock on you guys like SWAT guys go back and this is one of the best things about these body cams is we now have like video proof, hundreds of them, where guys have come up to the front door to do a search warrant. The door opens, they start getting shot at, and everybody freaks out outside and starts shooting back, shooting around the house, running around, getting shot, doing all that, and the bad guy's still alive. Um, and other people will point to them going, see, they're, they're, they're ill-trained. They didn't know. They had the same training you do. We are just U.S. law enforcement. We are high frequency very low chance of getting opposed. And when we do get it opposed, we react to it differently all everywhere. But generally it is people shooting back at things they can't even see. I would say generally, I've seen plenty of them where they just start shooting back because they're being shot at. Why'd you shoot? Well, you shot at me. You don't get to shoot back sometimes, dude. Like you just don't get to shoot back. You have to pull back to cover. Well, he's shooting at us. Good. Then don't get shot. Get back here. Bring a shield with you and don't get shot. Yeah. Um, guys will take the military side of the house from super high echelon units that do it a very specific way based on their environment because that's how it works there. And they're very successful at it. And they're opposed all the time. They go on a target. People are shooting at them. They're shooting back and they're killing bad guys through mud walls that you can't be shot through. You try to take that same mentality into suburban America with drywall where you can get shot through super easy and not everybody you get to shoot. You actually have to see them for sure, 100%. That is a bad guy shooting at me, and I can shoot him. You can't shoot back through the walls. And we say that with the front door all the time. You get to the front door, and I've been shot at through the door on several occasions. Knock on the door, you're breaching the door, the guy starts shooting through the door at you. What are you going to do? You can't shoot back. You cannot shoot back. Period. Well, they did it in Zero Dark Thirty. They were going after Bin Laden. They are killing everybody there. Like, Stop. You're the police in America. You can't shoot back through the door. You have to see what you are shooting at and actually have it be a threat. That was another side tangent of weirdness. I love it because I, you know, there's this misconception and to your point about the shield, it's like, well, we got to run back to a piece of cover. Why not take cover with you? You know, what oh, the, the covers in the car, you know, the, the, the well, why did you do that? Uh, I think is a, is a great point and I hope people are hearing that. Now, obviously there's no correlation between that and a civilian defender. We don't walk around with shields. We don't have them in our truck unless you're, you're weird for some reason, but uh, 
but for what you guys did, you know, that that's good stuff. And understanding like the ROE for, you know, uh, a tier one unit in somewhere else, some other country where they're doing their thing is completely different from the laws of self-defense within your city, within your department. You know, every damn department in America has a different use of force policy. Then every state has a different policy. And, and when they get done with a the shooting, there might be a debrief and a PowerPoint presentation on the ship or back at some fob with you guys. It's everything's going to, you know, everything's going to go probably before a grand jury or something like that. Right. Well, everything is going to be released to the, to the court of public within a few weeks. Like they're all going to have the videos, the body cam videos yeah. and the, and, and is the context right? Or are they understanding it? And are you making decisions based on what your camera is going to show? Like, what do they want me to do? There's so much like we, Rich, we could talk forever on use of force or response to resistance. I think that's the way we've changed things recently. And I like using those words instead of use of force. I like response to resistance for us law enforcement. Um, Cause that's what we're doing. Um, our presence is force, verbal persuasion. Our, our speaking to someone is force. It's generally guided that way. But I'm really responding to the resistance of another person. If they provide no resistance, why would I use force or why would I respond in any other way other than just talking to them? Um, if they shoot at me, I don't always get to shoot back. But if I have a clear target and that's the only way that I can make them stop doing it, then I then that's what's expected of me. But yeah, they, they'll go over there and the rules of engagement, everything's going to be different. The environment's different. From the East Coast to the West Coast and the Midwest, the environments are different. Like wooded areas, I don't have those out here. We don't have trees and jungle or whatever you want to call those places. When I go back east to New Jersey and I can't even see a horizon, that's weird to me. Um, and a dude will run away in Florida, he'll run 25 feet into that jungle and he's invisible. You couldn't get 25 feet away from anybody where I live and not be seen. We'll see you. Um, but yeah, rules of engagement, the guys want to train with these units. They have a ton of value to bring to you and they can teach you certain things, but without understanding the why of how you're going to apply that to your environment and really testing it in your environment, not just going, well, that's what they do. We're going to do it this way, you know, pony walls and combat clearance. And we're going to do, we'll cross cover every door that we can. That's all great. And it does work as a slow clear. But once the bullets start coming through the wall, that method is ineffective. Um, what other methods are available to you? When, you know, what are you truly capable of when opposed? Um, and then the opposition that we have against rules of engagement, if they go on to hit a target and everybody starts shooting at them from in a village, they're going to start shooting back or blow the thing up. They're not going to run in there, right? They're going to get a terrorist that, you know, number seven on the list, they're going to hit him and he's got 14 dudes with them. If they're opposed and compromised, they'll just blow the place up if needed. We cannot do that because we might have one dude or maybe two guys that would actually oppose us. And then you have his family inside. You got the little kids, like the idea of entering a home, this is strictly SWAT stuff, like entering a home on a search warrant and hitting a locked door and having the answer be, I'm gonna ballistically breach that is unacceptable. And you, to me, in US law enforcement, like as the go-to answer, I'm just gonna breach it. Why? Well, it's a locked door. Okay, who locked it? Well, the bad guy, he could, what if, what if the bad guy's in there with a gun waiting for me? Or what if it's his eight-year-old daughter? And she's scared shitless because all these noises are going off. She doesn't know what's going on. So she's sitting with her back against the door and it's locked and you're going to shoot a shotgun right over her head. That cannot be the answer to everything we do is, well, if A, then B. We're, we have to be, more of us has to be expected. We have to adapt to it. Um, I hate, I just hate the, like, we train to this breach a door. There's the bad guy with the gun. He's always in the deep corner, right? Or if I'm breaching the door and he does it, cool, he found him, right? The, all the active shooter training that law enforcement's been doing has value, but I've never seen it where nine dudes show up at the same time and go through. And the only person shooting a gun is the ballistic breacher, the guy shooting a shotgun at doors. No one else shooting a gun. The bad guy's already killed himself or he's run away, right? Your job is to go find him. Like, just breach the doors. Use other other methods. Well, I don't have one. Then you're failing yourself. Like, it go, there's so it's too deep. It goes way too much into preparedness versus training for the BS scenario that you made up in your head. And that seems like what we do too much. We train for one very specific thing. Cool. We all understand it. This is how it's going to go. And it is not going to go that way. Right. Like I said, the bad guy gets to vote. And sometimes he's not voting in the same election as you. He's doing something completely different. And it is not what you did in your scenario for training. Yeah, so exactly. I, like it, it's just different. We're not the military. Yeah. We're the police. And, you know, when you were 
uh, you were telling me a story one time. I think you were going through the kitchen and the guy starts shooting through the walls and the, and the, and the kitchen just kind of starts exploding. And, and while force on force is amazing, that's something you really can't capture in force on force. Sim rounds aren't going to go through the walls, you know, but, but in that situation they did. I mean, you know, and, and I think that is one of those times where, you know, so aggressive action is probably the right thing. I mean, we're not necessarily that we get to swing around and shoot through the walls and that's not appropriate perhaps, but you know, what are you going to do? You're, you're in a stack, you're moving, you're all tight. And then all of a sudden the kitchen starts exploding. What do you do? Right. Yeah. That, and so there's where training defaults, right? The runs. Um, and I've talked to some groups before about like, you can get that performance out of a group once or twice. And then you might start losing people who are like, I'm not doing this anymore. They have to have 100%, 100% mission buy-in to actually accomplish that. If dudes aren't sure, dudes won't go. Like if they don't truly believe in the mission, they will not be successful in the mission. Um, that one was a barricade we were on and it ended up being a co-defendant, but we did an explosive breach to the back. And as we were coming through the patio area, up through the kitchen and around, he is he's just emptying an AR through the walls at us. Like you said, the kitchen, microwave exploding, stuff's flying through the walls in between the entire stack of eight or nine guys. Nobody got hit. And we just kept trucking on right through that kitchen Around the corner, he ran out of ammo. As we got to the corner, he throws the gun down, puts his hands up, and he got taken into custody. Um, that was a, you know, I would have shot him. Cool. You, know, you, you weren't there. You didn't, so it's irrelevant. We didn't shoot him. He got taken into custody. He was out of bullets. He chickened out because he was, he was speed, surprise, violence of action, the monster, right? In his mind, that monster, he had a plan. I'm going to do this. I'm going to kill them all. I'll, st I'll slow him down. But when the monster came around the corner, he was like, I don't want any more to deal with this. And he's a very hardened bad guy. Good for a bunch of murders. Um, wow. Very hardened dude. But he was a, he was a punk once the bad men came around the corner after him. Um, but that goes to everybody's thing. Like, well, here's the plan. Roger that. Like, there's no plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's like plan A, plan B, figure it the fuck out. Because that's what you just have to do. You have to figure it out. Um, and your training, your reps, your exposure, the time um, spent doing it is going to give that mental Rolodex to the point where it's just running in the background and you have options. Um, it's probably the biggest thing that the, the armed citizen can do is just play the play the what if game. Um, like I challenge every single one of your viewers. Remember that, Rich? I yeah. challenge you. I challenge your viewers um, for the next week. When they go to the gas station, um, they might only go once a week. Whatever. Whenever they go anywhere to a store, at least once every week, they go or every day, they stop and they get they find a what if. Like, well, what if a guy ran out the door right now with a gun and ran off that way? What would I do? And then play it. Like, just tell it, picture it. He runs out the door, he runs away from me that way. Well, I'm going to call 911 from my car. Stay in your car. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my car and chase him. Whoa. Like really think out what you're going to do and think about the options you have, all of the options you have. Spend five minutes doing it. If I call 911, he runs around here and I lose sight of him, what benefit is it? I've got a good clothing. I have his last known direction of travel and I don't even know what happened. Is it, just because he ran out of the store with a gun, what does that mean? And ask yourself honestly, what does it mean? Uh, he robbed the place. Oh, does it? How about someone else did and this is another armed citizen who just ran out after him? Possible? 100%, absolutely possible. Should you probably call 911? Probably. Now, is that going to get the guy? I don't know. Like, do you understand how deep the scenario can go? Oh, yeah. um, guy runs out of the car, out of the store with a gun, and he runs up to your window, and he's banging on it. Let me in. Let me in. Whoa. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to shoot him. Okay. You're going to shoot him. Where? Like, I'll just pull my gun out and shoot him. Oh, through the glass and through your, your car, you're going to shoot him. What? Do it. But like, people get, like, it's not a magic bullet, right? You shoot him through your glass, it hits him in the stomach, he goes, ow, and he just starts shooting into your car. Because you're not, it's not stopping him. Again, gut shots aren't stopping people unless they want to quit. That's it. It's going to sting, and then they're going to go, ow, and they're either going to shoot you, or they're going to start shooting, or they're going to run away, or they're going to fall down and quit. Like, that, that psychological stop. But a guy who's in that panic mode of running out of a store, I don't think is prepared to psychologically stop from getting shot in the stomach through a car window. I think he's just going to either run away, like he got bit by a bug or he's going to start shooting at you through the car just reflexively. So thinking you're going to shoot him 
is that the option? And where are you going to shoot them? How are you? How many times are you going to shoot them? If people don't think about it deep enough to program their brain to react, there's all those what ifs they can play out ahead of time. Like a good cop should do that when they like you teach a new officer like, hey, we're pulling up the house. Where's where are you going to go to cover? Right over here. What if the neighbor's the problem? It's not here's our here's where we're called to. But what if the neighbor's the problem? He comes out with a gun and starts shooting us. Well, I would go here. Well, when would that ever happen? I don't know. Probably never. But if it did. And you've programmed yourself to start being aware of those things. It's still an experience. Your mind doesn't know the difference at all. If you if you role play it in your head, your mind sees that. In my understanding, I'm not a psychologist, but your mind sees that as a rep. It's like, oh, okay, I've experienced this before. I've thought about it. Um, I keep going on side tangents, but yeah, that's. I think it's important for people to really think about where they're going to use their skill sets, um, how likely they are to use them. And again, not, not everything revolves around using your gun. Yeah, that was great. And one of the things that you said, you know, I think you were talking, Chris, about when you go in through the kitchen and the, and the microwave starts exploding. And well, let's see, let me go through my Rolodex was uh, plan M was he shoots through the drywall. You don't have time for that. It's and I think that's where no, we're, we're planning and we're planning, and we're planning. Guys, you cannot plan for everything. I, you know, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but I think planning at some level pigeonholes your thinking. And then when one variable comes that it, you did not prepare for, it throws everything off. I think probably people are better off being prepared. You know, do I have my cell phone on me? Do I have a light in my pocket? Do I have my, you know, um, a firearm on me? Do I have closed toed shoes so that I can run? Have I taken care of my body so that my level of fitness has enabled me to flee from this situation? Does my truck have gas in it? All these little micro preparedness things that are going to help you when and when and if that time's needed. But I think this idea of, no, I've, I've planned for everything, Rich. The hell you have, man. There's just oh. absolutely no way. But are you prepared have you prepared what's between your ears? Have you prepared your body? Have you prepared your environment? Can you talk to some of that or am I smoking? No, it's, I think I missed it before. It's it's all mental preparation. It's all mental preparation. Like ask yourself, am I mentally prepared to deal with a crisis today? And that could be a medical, like you could roll up on a traffic accident. Am I medically, am I mentally prepared to see that and deal with it? Um, am I like the, the guy shooting at the wall through us on that one? That was just autopilot. It's the subconscious, like, well, this sucks. Like, it was obvious, but it was like the Matrix, literally like the Matrix, where it was like the bullets are going by, and you're like, man, can't hit the brakes. No one else is hitting the brakes, right? No one else is stopping, so I can't stop. We're going to go. Like, this is our thing. We're doing this. But if one dude in the front had gone and hit the brakes, I, I don't know what, I don't know how that would have changed that outcome. I think, was I mentally prepared at that time to push people out of the way and go, or would I have stopped and got back? Like that's the what if game, right? I can tell you in the moment that no one else stopped and we kept going and we went rounded the corner and however many seconds it took me to fire a charge, get up, go to that door and go through and we won. And did we won because we were amazing? No, we won because he ran out of ammo and he didn't hit any of us. And it literally came down to pure luck that we continued on with the mission and were successful, but it doesn't mean we did anything right. It just means that we didn't lose because you know, whatever. I have no idea how we didn't lose that or get any, not even nicked. Like we did, we looked at everybody's vest. I was like, I mean, there's gotta be like a piece that was hit, but it, and I think it's hard. Like I go on these tangents, it's weird, but if someone like, if any of the viewers, like your viewers and the people that you guys have been training have had a confrontation with someone and it was successful, did they succeed because of their training or in spite of it? Right. Did, yeah. It's just the way it went. Um, like I'd rather be lucky than good. I get it. But like sometimes really good preparedness, real and mental preparedness, really good training can make you more likely to get lucky. It kind of brings a little more luck on your side. But, yeah. They, you know, the definition I've heard of luck is it's where preparedness meets opportunity. Right. You know, so I don't know, but that it, it has a, a great little ring to it in my mind. Chris, I've kept you on here almost two hours, man. And you're going to have to let me do round two or three with you, brother. Cause I can, there's so Sorry, many things I wish that I would have been like more concise, but I like yeah. enjoy talking about the stuff, but it's, it's so deep. Like the mental, I'm telling you right now, the mental, I think you and I agree on the mental preparedness for what you could possibly see, possibly deal with can be done in your living room, 
It can be done driving to the store. And then the number one thing that gets most people is ego. Um, if you can't control your ego and take the, and understand the fact that everything that happens to you is not, is not because of you. It's not an affront to you. Um, cops can learn from it. He ran from me. Okay. I get it. Or he, you know, he, he, he called me an asshole. Are you an asshole? No, no fuck him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Sorry for the language, but like that people got to get their ego out of it. Um, and that I think is hard to do. It's the armed citizen. And I do in the quotes, right? The armed citizen, you're just an American that has a gun. Um, if you insert yourself, and if you if we have time, can we talk about that? The inserting of yourself into other people's problems and why it's not always appropriate. Um, because that's an I, ego thing. Let's unpack it, Chris. I mean, I have time. I, I wonder I, I know time. that you do have to get to the range here in a little bit, but I got all the time in the world. Hopefully we're not boring the people. But um, let me hit that one. That yeah. An ego. It all goes to ego. Guy and his wife are screaming and yelling at each other in the parking lot. You know, you son of a bitch. And it's, it is heated. It is verbal. It is almost physical. Do you get involved with that? Men don't treat women like that. Yeah, he does. And she's still there. And that's a crappy thing to say, right? But yeah, he does. And she's still standing there in front of him. Is that your business to get involved in it? Um, there have been plenty of times where a well-meaning person, because their ego tells them that you don't do that. You don't treat a woman like that. You don't talk to my mama like that. That ain't your mom. All right. You go and insert yourself in that. And that dude's going to look at you like you mind your business. And she's going to say, you mind your business. Now you got two people who don't want you around. All right. The ego, if you're that concerned about it, would it maybe be an option just to call the police? Call 911, the non I don't care who you call. But like I am in the parking lot of the whatever food store and there's a man yelling at a woman. I, yeah, I'm watching it right now. It's not physical. You know, they're screaming and yelling at each other. All right, we're having an officer come. They scream and yell at each other, get in the car and drive away. Do you follow them? They, she got in the car with them, right? I'm planning to play a scenario out for you. She got in the car with them. Do you follow them? Well, what if he attacks her? Dude, what if that's not your business, man? Like, you're not here to save the world. Like, you, especially if you're, fam you're with family, because I've seen that happen where dudes get involved in stuff with kids with them. Like that video of the guy, the guy road raging down the road. You see that with his kid in the car and he's chasing this dude and he finds a fire and gets, gets a gun out. What the hell are you doing? You asshole. Like, don't, in, don't involve yourself in other people. They don't want your business. They don't want your help. If she wanted your help and she's screaming, like, get away from me and trying to escape from someone. There's a different story. But if he smacks her upside the head and she keeps yelling at him, it's not your business. Call the police. Keep an eye on it. If he starts choking her out or doing something where you're like, I, now I got to get it. Now I have to intervene. Like that's a choice we all have to make. At what level do I insert myself in somebody else's business? There's the big difference between the, the citizen, the citizen, armed citizen, and the police officer who is just an armed citizen. It's their job. They cannot, they're by reason of employment, cannot blow it off. They are required to go insert themselves in that on behalf of society, on your behalf. You are not. And while it may make you feel better to go and involve yourself in a situation like that, are you truly doing what's best for society or are you doing what's best for your ego? Because when it goes sideways and the guy punches you in the face and you pull your gun out and shoot him, I'm telling you right now, it's probably not going to end well. Um, and that has happened. People have involved themselves in situations and then the gun is their only answer. It's the only thing they've ever trained on. They don't even have medical training. The gun comes out and then it becomes a magic talisman. I'm going to point it at him. You better get back. You leave me alone. And they've got that magic talisman out there. Like it's some sort of shield that's going to defend against evil. And it's not, it's, it's just a tool. Pull a hammer out, pull your phone out. Phone's more useful, right? Take a picture of the dude. Um, if the gun comes out, I, this is just my feeling. The gun out and pointing at people, we've, we've crossed the line. We've now gone into a new realm and we've introduced something that, if you don't have the opportunity to use it, and until you've actually run into a guy and you point a gun at him, like, fuck you, shoot me. Darn it. And you know you can't. And then you just put the gun away and you go arrest him. Um, a lot of people should experience that. Uh, if the gun comes out, you should probably be shooting people with it. And until then, it probably needs to stay away. And you need to use space, time, get away from people the best you can. But if it comes out, it's probably time to shoot. Not use it as a warning device. Does that make sense? Brother, that was well worth the price of admission to this morning's uh, show. That was awesome.
And I hope everybody heard it because, you know, th there's so many examples we can throw out there. There's the, the one that I always look, look at is I think the guy's name was Terry Thompson. His wife's a cop. He's not. They go out into the Denny's parking lot. There's some guy pissing over in the corner of the Denny's parking lot, minding his own business at two in the morning, taking a leak behind somebody's car. It's a, it's kind of a nothing burger, man. Go on about your business, but everybody's been drinking. The guy's pretty <coughs> jacked, you know, the wife's a cop. Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. He decides to insert himself into this public urination, takes the guy to the ground, chokes him to death. Now he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. It's like, for what? Because he offended you. Yeah. For what? He offended my sensibilities. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit about your sensibilities. Yeah. It, it makes no sense to me, man. <coughs> the, the ego will get you killed as, as quick as anything. Your own ego. Uh, and it, you have to set it down. I mean, and I think that if you're confident and competent and capable in what you bring to the table, you're less likely to, to escalate force or use excessive force. That is just my thoughts. What do you think? No, it, confident, right, in your abilities and actually capable of doing them. Um, I'm going to hit two points on that because it's important for the LA world and the civilian world, um, which are really the same thing. I keep saying, trying to separate the two, but they're the same damn thing. One of them is just a job. Um, if you're less like, the, the more confident you are, the less like you are to bite like a, a corner chihuahua. And the more aware you are of your own capabilities, the less like you are to even be involved in them, is to recognize them ahead of time. That's what we talked about before. Like, recognizing that something could go wrong over here and avoiding it. Avoidance is like the number one coolest tool on the planet. Like just be invisible. Like a shooting occurred at Circle K today. They're like, I was just there. It's probably the dude in the orange shirt. And it was that guy, right? Like don't, like just not being involved in it is better, right? I mean, it's, I don't even know how to explain that any better. Um, the competency part, I want to talk about the law enforcement part of it because this to me is important. We've discussed it at work. Um, providing training, right? Because I, just because I've provided you with training does not mean you're competent or even capable of it. And because you were present does not mean you were trained. So you were at the training yeah, 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 and you sign the roster that says that you're 100% capable. In my opinion, if you've signed a roster that says you attended training, that's us, the trainer saying that you are capable of it competent and you have demonstrated in front of me that you can do these proficiencies. But if we go about that world of like just being present and training and signing the roster um, in the law enforcement world, we are 100% wrong. Um, it has to be a, that, that he did, right? We explain what we want to do. I'm going to demonstrate it. You're going to imitate it. You're going to practice it. And then I'm going to test you on it. Show me technique A. They do it. Show me technique B and C. They demonstrated proficiently that they can do all of those things in a, a sterile testing environment. I will sign off that they are capable of it. So that way, when they don't do it in a real world or they forget to do it, we can at least say, that, hey, that we did train them to do it. And when we train them to do stuff that doesn't work, we have to take that same thing back and go, we're doing this and it's not working. We need to revamp that. We can't go and blame, well, we're doing this, it's not working because they don't know how to do it the right way. Then you're not training them the right way. So they're not doing it. If, it, if we know the technique is 100% vetted, it's valid, we've, we've bounced it off other law enforcement agencies, we've taken the time to say, hey, we've had professional trainers, civilians come in, we've bounced it off this guy, legally, morally, ethically, ethically, this is the right way to do this specific thing and handle it, it's a good technique, and it's not working, we're either not holding it to the standard to do it right way, or we're using the wrong thing and we need to revisit it. But we have to stop doing it. Well, we, we, we trained them to do this, Obviously you didn't because they didn't do it. So it's a training failure. I like to blame at work. I like to blame stuff up. Um, they know that I blame it up. Like if I'm not doing a good job, um, that means your supervisor's not doing a good job of ma making sure, not making you do it, but ensuring you have the tools to do it. And if he's not doing that for me, then his supervisor's not doing it for him. Up, 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 up. The blame goes up. And I think it's always the way it's been in the military, right? If you have a unit, an organization or an element that is an absolute garbage dump, dumpster fire. The guy in charge, that's whose fault it is. And by moving that, switching it out, you can actually change culture going down. But you put out that support going, this is what's expected of you from the leadership. And if they can't meet it, you find a way to remediate or teach them. They will eventually meet it. And we can weed out the ones who can't. But until you have effective, very supportive leadership up top for the right thing, nothing's ever going to get fixed. It has to be supported 
with clear expectations from the top that everybody knows how they can meet them. And when they don't, we try to help them. And if you can't, you get rid of them. Yeah, spot on. And, and Brett Parker, who's a retired law enforcement officer from Southern California, he says, preach brother truth. Yeah. And I, I I agree with everything you just said. And uh, yeah, I had a couple of things I was going to add on to that, but I don't even know that I can do it, do it justice by adding on to it. Cause it, it is exactly what you said. I know what I was going to say and you'll appreciate this when we were, uh, when we go and train these agencies, you know, like uh, next week we out there doing some training, firearms instructor development. Great Sometimes class. when I debrief on Friday, I hear the, I didn't know I was going to be doing this much teaching. Like, well, how the hell did you think I was going to evaluate you as a, as an instructor? Well, I thought we were going to do a bunch of shooting. Well, that doesn't evaluate you. Can you deliver material? We just go out here and make it, make the gun go bang every day. And at the end of it, we hand out a, a certificate and go about our way and collect up our rosters. Right. That that's not, it's not training. Right. I mean, no, not for instructor. Instructors need to train to teach. We need to learn new techniques. We learn, learn like, I'm dealing with recruits now from literally 20 years old to 47 years old. We have that mix and they're from all across society, all across America grow up like, and they don't even know each other's stories. And I, that is where I've gotten the most benefit from probably that class is getting to know them as individuals and not viewing them as recruits. Mm -hmm. um, another side tangent. Um, we have a, a, a man in our class, a class, a couple classes ago, he's actually recycled for firearms. He's had, he, it's difficult for him to understand. And we're trying to find out how better ways to help him understand the qual, right? Un you know, just try to learn, teach him to do better at the gun. But he's, I think he's 47 years old. He's been shot in the leg, grew up in a poor part of town, um, gang involvement when he was younger. Um, we're talking in the 80s and 90s. And I have a 20-year-old kid in the same class who hasn't got a fart of a clue as to this man's life experience, right? And this kid's cocky and he shoots okay and he does all this stuff. But I'm looking at him going, man, like this dude has value already because of his life experience. You can just shoot okay, and you're an idiot in the overall sense of things. No offense, but he figures out who he is. Yeah. He just, he's me with 20-something years ago, right? 30 years ago where you're like, listen, listen there, Turbo, yes. right? Like, let's just walk down. Like, <laughs> let's, not, let's not run down. Let's walk down and figure this out. And I know that he could go, if I, you know, our old man, if I said, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Well, you know. I think we should talk to this person about that because he's had 47 years of life behind those decisions. Um, and there is no replacement for time. Um, and I keep just going off in tangents. And there's one I really wanted to ask. Oh, so did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. All right. I got to ask people this question because maybe this is, we like to make fun of the, the meme or whatever it is that came out. It's like, imagine reimagining law enforcement, right? So in law enforcement, we make fun of that. Yeah, reimagine. Well, we already talked about like the guys that were cops in the 70s. Thought the guys that had it in the 80s were easy, 80s, 90s, thousands. We're at 2021. Um, the 70s cop, that job's dead. It's not the same job anymore. The overall principles are there. The expectations have changed. The tools, the equipment, the technique, the techniques, the tactics, all that's changed. Um, being a good cop has not. Being curious, like wanting to go out and find what bad guys are doing and catch them and stop them from victimizing people, that's not changed. But the way it has. And maybe the way that we view law enforcement has to change. And I've asked people this before, I asked your viewers, I just wanna know what people's opinion is. If we took law enforcement and treated it more like the military, not the military that goes out and kills people, but the way it's structured, where you could hire law enforcement officers by MOS, right? By occupational specialty. And the patrolman to me should be the pinnacle of that professionalism. They are the first point of contact with society. They are the ultimate expectation and the demonstration of what the department is. That's the face of the department. I don't care who the chief is or who everyone else is. The face of the department is the person that your community gets when they show up at their door and knock on it to take the burglary report, the stolen bicycle or the domestic violence. That's who it is. That person has to have a unique set of skills. Um, Shooting is one of them. Defensive tactics or combatives is what I would prefer to call it. All those hard skill sets, hard and it's almost like the infantry, right? If our patrolmen were treated them like the infantry, these hard skill sets, compassion, all these things go along with it, but they are not an idiot. 
like they have the high GT score. They're very intelligent. They know how to talk to people. They can do those things, but they can also do these things well. They're stronger. They're bigger, faster. Why do I need that street experience? Why do I need to expose people to that environment on the street to have them be a good detective? Why can't I hire people to do that? And why do I even need them to be armed if they're a case manager, right? The FBI has incredible investigative resources and personnel. They have no street experience, but they're super exceptionally good at what their job is, right? I know they have FBI SWAT and FBI HRT and they have other units to do it, but for the grand scheme of things, they're investigative positions where they're managing cases and, you know, can't we view law enforcement that way? We're, we need people to run the front desk. We need people to be victims rights advocates. We need people to be recruiters. We need people to be uh, domestic or domestic violence detectives, document crime detectives. It's not to say that they're not police. It's not they're, It's not trying to degrade that position. But if I could hire people and go, hey, would you like to help people get their money back who've been scammed? They're like, oh yeah, I want to do that job. They want to help. And you got to go do all this. I don't want to do the, the fighting stuff and the gun stuff. Well, how are they going to be a cop? How are they going to know how to do it? They go get a cop, say, go get that dude and bring him to me. And then they investigate it. And then they go to court and they prep it and they do all, they spend their time learning to be the most exceptional investigator, case manager they possibly can, while you leave the running around in the alleys and the mud to the guys who really, really want to do it. Instead of putting people out there who just want to escape it. They just want to escape that life of patrol because there's people that love the job. They want to get out of that job, some job where they don't have to perform work. And now they're a mediocre detective. And that's probably going to bust some eagles and hurt some feelings. But we learned it in SWAT just a while ago. Guys do not come to test for us to be the negotiator. They don't. Nobody is testing going, I want to be the negotiator. It's a, every single one of them, we go through the 40-hour FBI negotiator school, and it has absolute value. It teaches you how to talk to people, right? How to use empathy, how to active listening skills. All these things it teaches you are valuable, and every patrol officer should go through them. But nobody is testing to come on our unit to be the negotiator. They want to they want to blow stuff up. They want to break things. They want to catch bad guys. They want to have fun. It is that's what SWAT is. Um, it's not there to shoot people. There's no there's no glory or fame or awesome. There's no fun in shooting sad people, right? Um, but that's not what they hired on for. But we used to do it all the time. Hey, new guy, you're the negotiator. The dude hasn't even got the SWAT guy out of the system yet, and you're putting him in a position to watch it and not really get it out. Um, we then switched it to where people could come and test specifically for that position. And I'm telling you right now, the passion they have for that job is without measure. That's all they want to do. They don't want to run around and shoot stuff. They don't want to wear 60 pounds of gear and stand in the sun for eight hours. That's not what they want to do. They want to resolve situations using all of the techniques that you can teach them. And they're exceptional at it because that's what they want to do. And I kind of wish we would just long tangent, right? But I kind of wish we could reimagine law enforcement that way where we have personnel that do certain things and we're hiring very specified people or viewing that talent pool. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. And I think they'd be even happier. Hey, Timmy, you're guess what you're going to be. You're going to be a juvenile diversion officer. You're going to work with kids. You're going to do the palace programming do athletics with them all that stuff. Oh, that's great. Do I have to call on my gun? I hate this thing. Nope. We're not worried about that. Um, you're not going to get paid as much. Maybe some of that stuff gets a pay increase, right? I, I like that idea too. Like the patrol guys, I, I think our patrol guys should get paid more, 5%, something more so that you want to escape it, good, take your pay cut and you're going to go do another job. Well, I do hard work too. Great. It's a different work. They're exposed to different things. I think they should get paid more than me. I, I get to hang out at the range and shoot and teach all day. I don't need to get paid as much as them. Maybe my job should be civilianized. There's a lot of jobs that we do, that we pay cops to do full time that civilians can do, especially firearms instructors, right? Like the, the greatest units in the world do not go to themselves to learn how to climb a mountain. They go to these young dudes in Yosemite and go, hey, how do you climb a mountain? Like, hey dude, like totally like this. And they emulate it, right? Skydiving, they head down here and they learn how from pot smoking hippies to skydive and fly like birds because they're better at it. They're the best in the world. And even the best firearms instructors in the world are all civilians, in my opinion. Uh, Rob Latham, Mike Seeklander, you, like all these people who have so much talent as an instructor, lots of them are civilians. They might've been former military or former somewhere else, but they're, look to who is the best, don't internalize and have that incestuous training relationship that 99% of departments have. 
and you're doing things just because that's how we've always done them. Sorry, I just keep going. No, you're great. I want to unpack some of that. You know, like I remember uh, when we were on the the first day of our SRT training, and I remember there was like three or four dudes there that that were kind of pudgy looking and soft and. You know, back then I didn't wear glasses. And they're kind of nerdy looking, but they got the black pajamas on like us. I'm like, I didn't see these guys in the NDOC. What the hell are they doing here? <laughs> but our, our department was smart enough to know, like, we need our own people running. Ma this was for the uh, corrections environment. So we need our own people running master control so that when we kick everybody out of the facility so that we can go in and do our black pajama stuff, who's going to run master control? And we want our own people. So they didn't have to go through the whole two week, uh, you know, kicking the nuts, but they did go through like one or two days just as an, just to get a taste of what, what we have to go through. And then they get to go do their specific skill training. And I thought, well, that that's genius, man. We don't need a knuckle dragger in there trying to learn programming to, to do this stuff in master control. We have a guy that that's what he wants to do. That's how he can contribute to the team. So I think your idea is, is has a, a lot of merit to it, man. I wish more people saw the value of that. You can get more out of people. Like every ultra cat guru, ultra level tip spear unit you can think of. I'm not making fun of them, but everybody looks at that and goes, well, this is what they do. They do that with all their enablers, all of them. You have a group of this many dudes that are your operators going in with enablers out the wazoo. They're not doing their own medical. They're not doing their own calls for fire. They're not, they're all capable of it, but they have people in place who are exceptionally good at that spe specified task and multiples of them that enable that thing to happen. They didn't get, they didn't fly the planes there themselves. They didn't fly the helicopters themselves. They had dudes do that for them. Why? Because they're the best pilots on the planet. Um, but everything, like enablers make everything happen. And giving credit to those people is important. You can't just be like, yeah, 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 we're the, we're the SWAT team. Do we ain't doing nothing without the guy driving us there in the armor? We're not doing anything without the perimeter support and the canines and everything else. Um, and a department could look at it the exact same way. If you build that organism to be sufficient, like the military, like especially the Marine Corps, doing more with nothing, yeah. um, it all still works. Still get everything done, and everybody can feel special in their own way. But it's until we stop looking down on people, it's not going to change. Um, you need people to help you get your job done. Yeah, Chris, man, spot on, brother. I got one final question for you, and then I'll have to take these other questions and beg you to come back on for round uh, two. Okay, so you've been on, uh, you've been involved in in it, quite a few shootings, right? You've been in thousands and thousands of use of force incidents. What can the average person watching or listening today do to make themselves harder to kill? Uh, a lot. Get training. Um, even on your own, the mind, the mind is where the training happens. The hard skill sets, um, are all still in the mind. Uh, take an honest assessment of your environment, yourself, your skill sets you already have, where are you at and what are you capable of? And then what are you going to change about that? What are you most likely to run into? Um, and I, I would, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure someone that lives in Manhattan is likely to run into different things than you are. They're not going to run into bears and farm accidents, you know, dirt roads and cars crashing off like that. It's just a different environment. Um, medical is huge to me. I think the average citizen should learn way more about what they're actually capable of doing and what's required for immediate medicine on themselves and other people. Cause I think you're more likely to save somebody else due to accident than you are to get in a gunfight with a bad guy. I just, I got a feeling that's more likely to happen. Um, I have 100% confidence that you're more likely to have to talk your way out of something or avoid it than you are to do any of those things. Um, getting training from like competent people like you guys, the American War Society. Um, go get some jujitsu training. Go, I don't know, like just get out of your bubble, be aware, be confident, um, support everything that goes on for your family, and think of that first. Like ego again, ego is the bad, the bad thing that keeps popping up. But get your ego out of it and just ask yourself, what do I really need to do? If I'm by myself and the active shooter happens at the mall, do you want to go get involved in it? Okay, do so. But if you're running around the mall with a gun and the cops come in another door, how is that likely to end up? And I'm not saying don't do it, but 
that goes to the whole gun thing. Like if I don't have anything to shoot as a citizen and I go on these tangents and you know, I apologize. If there's nothing to shoot, put the gun away. When it comes time to shoot, get the gun out and then start shooting. Don't pull it out unless you're ready to do it. Um, does it make sense? Like that's just one of those scenarios I've run through my head with the family. Like I am always armed, but if it happens at the mall and I'm with them, I'm sorry, America, I'm not coming to save you. I'm taking them away, period. End of sentence, call me coward, I don't care. I am taking my family away from that and protecting just them. If I'm by myself, I'm probably gonna go get in a fight, but I'm not gonna run around the mall looking like I do with a gun, because I'm probably gonna get shot by a scared 22 year old cop kid that comes through the door. No offense, 22 year old cop kids, but I don't wanna deal with that one. I don't wanna be like shooting at the bad guy and then get shot because they're scared. Cops get scared. Um, dude, there's, I would do like a monologue of four hours of just rambling BS. And I feel like I've already missed that question, but like getting harder to kill just comes with recognizing where you're at. Avoid it. Number one, avoid it. Avoid, avoid confrontation, avoid when possible. That's going to make you the hardest thing in the world to kill. Um, thinking that the answer is you're going to do an appendix draw through your window in your car with the guy's carjacking right there. And you're going to tan ring him right through the eyeball. And that's going to end it for you. Highly unlikely. It just it is what it is. Highly unlikely. Um, the gun isn't the answer to everything. The gun is the last resort. And when it is, it's probably a shit show. So be prepared to get shot. So you better have medical training. Um, and then when that's all over and you won and all you did was get shot in the arm, your arm's screwed up for the rest of your life, period. It is going to have problems. And you're, you got the tourniquet on and the cops show up and you put the gun away and you've done everything. You're still not, it's not over. It isn't like the difference in law enforcement. We deal with it. And after a few days, you're, you go back home to your family and it's just assumed that you did everything right. Um, even though you're going to get second guessed in LA, it's assumed everything's okay. So you're not going to jail that night. Um, the armed citizen, maybe you do. If you're out drinking and you're freaking sitting there and you get in a fight, justifiably so, you get in a fight and the gun comes out and you end up shooting somebody, can you see where that would probably not be the best option? Um, not to say that it doesn't need to happen, but you put yourself in that position or anyway, and therefore avoidance rule number one, you you screwed that one. You screwed that one up and you stuck yourself in a situation where a bad decision had to be made and you're that's the only one you have left is a drunk guy with a gun that gets in a gunfight and shoots somebody. That could be bad. Um, yeah, harder to kill. Get training, prepare yourself mentally, take that challenge of every opportunity you get, go, if this happened, if this happened right now, what would I do? I would do this. Cool. And you're done. It takes 10 seconds. If this happened, what would I do? Okay, I'm done. And you start to prep yourself in your head so you don't have to live in a constant state of paranoia. You're just already kind of mentally rol Rolodexing that for yourself. Now, part of the mental Rolodexing it for yourself needs to be at the end of the shooting, don't think the cops are going to roll on the scene and give you a crisp high five. You're no. probably going to get proned out. You're probably going to get cuffed. Probably gonna go go down there. They're probably gonna draw your blood or something like that to find out if you're all coked out when you shot this guy or drunk or whatever. I mean, uh, part of that mental preparation is don't just stop at the the moment that you became the community hero that you that you fantasized being. Think it all the way through. Think that nightmare through of now you got to take out another mortgage on your house to to pay the bond until it all gets sorted out or whatever the case is. I mean, the, the, these are things that I don't think a lot of our uh, community really thinks through. Maybe they do. I don't. I don't know. And it it one hundred percent depends on where you live. Um, yeah. If you're in Texas, and you shoot the dude, and you put the gun down, the cops show up, and you got hands up like this. Hey, this is what happened. And here's the surveillance camera up on the Walmart, and it shows exactly what you said happened. Probably gonna get a little good job. <laughs> yeah. um, but you do that in Chicago, and you're not allowed to have a gun. You're looking at problems. You do that in places where your your freedoms are limited. Um, it's going to be a problem. Um, I remember one of the questions, I hate to keep this going, but one of the things you asked me is like, how can a citizen get involved to help an officer? Yeah. Um, there are people that, and I don't like the word fantasize, they, they envision like if I saw an officer getting in trouble, I would go help them. Um, we as law enforcement need to do a better job of teaching our officers that there are people there to help and that you may have to accept that help at times. But until then, until that's pretty much understood, I'm gonna tell you right now, getting involved in that, again, not your business. Getting involved in that, you've 
you have a criminal element you think that the officer is dealing with, and he thinks everybody's out to get him, especially in that moment. Um, if it is a point where he's got a gun out shooting at a person with a gun out and you pull a gun out, that might just turn into him shooting at you. Um, you have to really assess that situation. There's very few law enforcement officer involved shootings ever that end with a guy shooting it up and then staying right where he's at, right? Fantasy land parking lot, traffic stop. You're walking out. You see a guy, an officer pulling over a car into the parking lot. Bad guy gets out, officer gets out, a, a gun, sh a gunfight occurs between the two of them. The bad guy jumps in the car and drives away is usually what's going to happen. He's not going to stand around waiting for the rest of the cops to show up. But you get your gun out at the exact same time and you're shooting at the bad guy. Officer's not hit. He turns, sees you shooting, panic shoots at you. Um, did you need to involve yourself or did your ego tell you to involve yourself because you wanted to be a hero? Um, it is, I think that's super hard to figure out on the cop side of the house. If he is hurt, if the officer is hurt and he's down and the bad guy's still up and shooting, I don't know how the officer's going to shoot you then, right? If he's down, shoot the bad guy. If that's what you want to do, if that's what you choose to do to get involved. But understand that now you might become the center of attention for that. <clears throat> if the officer's down and you go to help him, I would highly suggest you don't do so until it's safe for you to go up to him. If you need to shoot a bad guy and shoot them, it needs to be over. And you need to put the gun away to go help the cop. And you may have to take the cop's gun away because we teach our guys to do that. If they're not in control of themselves, you can get shot standing up, pass out, hit the ground, blood pressure changes, you come back lucid again, and now a guy is over the top of you and you have a gun in your hand. Um, we will disarm cops and civilians and everybody. We'll just take it away. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, I get it. You need your gun. No, you don't. Take it away. Give them an unloaded gun if you think the cop needs it that bad. Um, this, there's, there's too much nuance to that. It would almost be like a class of understanding how to deal with that in a medical aspect. Um, when people are hurt, it's probably not a good idea. They're not 100% lucid in their brain. It's probably not a good idea for them to have a firearm. And we go about how to deal with that. Uh, there's a San Diego video. He got shot in the neck. Um, he's like running that. back to the car with the rest of the guys trying to hold his neck. And he has a gun in his hand the whole time. And you can see he's just circling the drain, getting less and less lucid. He has a gun in his hand. Um, that could go bad for everybody. Uh, that's It's just too deep. Like there's... I think everything comes down to like the base principle of, is it your business? Is your ego telling you what that's what you need to get involved in? And what benefit is it to the greater good that you actually involve yourself in it? Um, if anything, like yell out, like, officer, I'm here to help you. Can I help you? Ask. Just like a choking person, right? Ask. Like, are you choking? Do you want my help? Like, officer, I can help you. Do you want my help? I'm a citizen. I'm unarmed. I'm here to help you or I have a gun. I can shoot back or you can take, you know what I mean? Just don't overthink it. Just ask, like, can I help you? And if he's unable to give you consent, you do what you think is right. If he says, yes, help me help him. If he says, no, go over there, go over there. All right. And he dies because of it. That's his choice. We got to train our guys better. Maybe you can accept some help, but that trust is hard to do because we want to say we trust our community, but, is he's involved in that shooting, society shooting at him? Does he want to accept help from anyone else that he is, he knows not 100% is on their team, right? And that's the same as the active shooter. They run into the uniform, you're wearing your flip-flops and board shorts and you have a gun. You don't look like you're on their team right now. Could you be engaged? Yes. So I don't know, man. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and Real life's hard. <laughs> One of the things you talked about, Doc, defense of third party. You said, you know, hey, man, call me a coward, but I'm getting my family out of there. There was some, I wish I knew who it was, but it was a some nationally recognized trainer, and he's doing some uh, UTM training, and he's got everybody suited up, you know, with the, the helmets on and everything, and it's a defensive third-party scenario. But So they bring the guy in there, and he's he's got a SIM gun on, and the situation evolves to where the, they pull a gun on the clerk, and the guy going through the training runs out of the room, they're like, they go chasing after him. Like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm getting the hell out of there. And he's like, yeah, but, yeah, but you're armed. He's like, yeah, the gun's for me, man. I'm getting out of here. My wife's and kids are probably in the car in the parking lot. We're gone. You know, I'll call it in, but I'm not, I'm not getting involved in this. And the, the famous trainer kind of wrote an article about it, which I thought was good. He's like, I hadn't really expected that response, but there's nothing wrong with that response either. Oh. You could be a good witness, man. And and he's like, I keep thinking about that student telling me the gun is for me. It's for me and my family. 
And if I, if, especially if I'm not, if I'm a law enforcement officer, I have to be there. That's a different, I'm answering the radio. I'm going to the call. I'm doing the, I'm doing my job. Otherwise I'm going to probably be a good witness, man. That's, you know, that I'll have to live with the morality of that. And there's too many variables to unpack, but I kind of, I kind of side with that opinion. What do you, that's I'm, when I'm with my family at home, I'm a citizen. I this you're a cop 24 seven. You can kiss my butt. I am a father and a husband period. Um, I am there to defend them. If I'm not with them and I think I can add value to it, I know what's going on. I will probably try to take control and tell people, get over here, do this. Let's go here. Hey, I'm a police officer. Call 911, do this and that. Tell them what I'm wearing. That whole thing. They always tell people to do with their family. Hey, honey, I'm going to go get involved in this. Tell them, tell them what I'm wearing. Tell them I'm armed. Call 911. They run off in the mall and you run that way. And that's where they get shot. Like, that's how I view it. I, the third party I'm defending is my family, period. And a sentence first. Those are the third parties I'm more worried about than you. Sorry to break it to you. Um, and as you should be for me. Getting involved in it beyond that. I don't know. I, I keep sidetracking myself with that whole that idea. Like it is for you. Be a good witness. And I'll tell you this, more armed robberies. I know this to be a fact. Armed robberies occur every day. One probably just now happened somewhere in the United States and nobody got shot. Yep. Right. So making or Pointing violence, you causing violence is the only time you can do it. You're shooting cause violence because you're the one shooting. You didn't cause a bad guy to shoot the clerk or yourself or anything else. He chose to do that. But inserting yourself when it likely isn't going to happen is where the value is at, is not doing that. I have personally watched armed robberies occur in a store where we were following guys around. And we know it is a bad idea for us to burst through the door and just shoot because we got to just shoot the dude. right? You can run in and go, please don't move. And it, the gunfight's going to happen. Or it's not. Who knows? But running through the door right then isn't the best tactic. And that's the difference between everything else and actual tactics. Like, let him rob it. He ain't shot nobody yet. What if he does? And then let's go shoot him. He ain't robbed. He ain't shot nobody yet. And every time. It hasn't happened other than once. Every I don't know how many of those I've done. I'll, I'll make up a number, say 50. I know it's more than that. We've watched them do the armor. We've watched them commit the crime and then leave and get in their car. And they're assed up. And they're freaked out for a little bit. They cool off. They go home, we arrest them on the way to work the next day, like, or whatever it is they're doing, or we'll arrest them, we'll jump them, we'll do something if we need to get it. The big stringer guys like that, they're going to jail that night. We will stop their car, we'll make them stop, and we will arrest them. And if they choose to fight us, we'll fight them, and we'll win, um, because we're choosing to do it. But again, that I think that's the perfect answer. You're standing in there, I think I, see the, I, saw, I saw the video you're talking about, and the guy's like, all right, give me the money. The dude's like, whoop, out the door, yeah. on 911. Now, if he runs out and chases you with his gun, hey, shoot him. Yeah. Like, but you, yeah, you thinking you're this that a gunfight's a one way street because you you can do an appendix draw and hit a target in one second. It's not the same thing. It's not hands relax aside. You're not standing there ready for it. It's just some shit that's going to happen. And even in that training, you know something's going to happen. But I've been to some fun training where. You had no idea. You knew crap was going to happen constantly, but you didn't know when it was. So you lived in a constant state of paranoia for a week because while at lunch, dudes would come in and start shooting you. And on your way to your room, dudes would shoot at you. Like it's just mayhem breaking loose all over those kind of training. But even that still, you know, it's there. But that's like saying you go, go sit on your toilet and play on your phone and have somebody kick the toilet door in on you and point a gun at your face. And even if you have a gun right next to you, are you going to go, oh, no, no. You're gonna go, oh what? Speed, surprise, violence of action got you, right? Yeah, it works both ways, man. And that, that, like to your point, you know, the enemy gets a vote. We always said that in the Marine Corps, the enemy gets a vote. And speed, surprise, and violence of action are tools of the enemy, just like they're the tools of us. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for coming on this morning. I said I'd do sponsors at the end. Let me do the quick sponsors, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Please check out AmericanWarriorShow.com for the, the discounts to all of our amazing show sponsors. There's a reason why they're our sponsors. We use the products and believe in the products. Century Martial Arts, Makers of the Bob XL. Put your, get your strike routine going. Prepare yourself and your mind for the eventuality. Get yourself a Bob XL. APPHemp.com. My good friend Jesse Ross. We're in the Marines together growing some amazing CBD products. They're full spectrum. You will pop on a piss test. If you're worried about that, then don't use them. But they do have some other things that you can use that will help you uh, recover better. <coughs> and at, at my age and Chris's age, it's recovery is, is a big part of it. 
Cool Fire Trainer, man, ammo prices are through the roof. Get yourself a Cool Fire Trainer. Take your dry fire routine to the next level. Mountain Man Medical, you heard Chris say it. Mr. Palmer's told you many times you need to get that trauma medicine thing going. You need to learn. Pick up a kit at Mountain Man Medical. We have a co-branded kit from those guys over there. Please check them out. Precision Holsters, makers of the Ultra Appendix line that Mike and I use, their competition line as well that we use. Mike's the world champion. I'm just a, a, an old guy that goes out there and, and competes because I believe I need to put myself under some real world stress. I wouldn't call myself a competitor, but but I do use the competitive line at precisionholsters.com. Please check them out. They keep the show on the road. Chris, where can people find you, man? Um, I actually started an Instagram page at the advisement of some friends that I trust. So I'm at 532insight on there. LLC, 532Insight LLC. Um, yeah, that's really it. I can be emailed there, cp at 532insight.com. That's the company. I don't have a website up and running. Um, eventually, I'm e nearing retirement eventually, and even before that, I'll probably figure out some open enrollment classes. I just have to know how to do it the right way first so I can actually give somebody a good product they can learn from. Um, other than that, I just enjoy working and teaching. So if you guys have questions, anything you want to do, Hit me up on Instagram or by email. Um, I answer every question I get within reason. I don't think anyone on here is going to ask stupid ones, but yeah, that's about it. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. We got to do a round two if you're up for it sometime. Anytime. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Guys, thank you for joining us this morning. Whether you watch the show, listen to the show, whatever you did, I appreciate you. Hopefully you found this content very usable. And if you did, please share it with someone that needs it because uh, we have you don't get to talk to someone with Chris's experience very often, and we just appreciate you taking the time. Folks, remember the fight is coming. Be ready.